calling this meeting to order as the co-chair, Governor Baker's extension of the March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the working group. Given that we have a quorum present, I'm calling today's meeting um, on October 14th, 2021 to order at 5.34 p.m. I will call upon each member of the working group by name. At that time, they should unmute their mic and say present. This will indicate that they can hear me and we can hear them. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Uh, Ms. Ferreira? Present. Mr. Vernon Jones? Present. Ms. Pat? Yeah. Um, our first order of business is the public comment section of the agenda. If any member of the public would like to make a statement, please raise your hand. I will recognize you and ask Ms. Moyston to turn on your microphone. I ask that comments be limited to no more than three minutes. The working group will not be responding to your comments, but listening carefully. So we have no hands. So I'm just gonna quickly go over the agenda and then we can go right into the LEAP presentation. Um, so tonight on the agenda, we have the LEAP presentation. We will hopefully approve and go over the report for part B of our charge. Pages 15 through 29 have been updated. We'll talk about um, CRESS implementation. We will review um, the resident oversight board follow-up. And lastly, we'll talk about the community safety and social justice committee. Um, so I get, oh, Ms. Ferreira. Sorry, I just wanted to kind of do a a quick kind of report, just acknowledgement in terms of, you know, the CSWG member report. I just wanted to say quickly in terms of, obviously we've heard in the news um, in regards to the police, I'm forgetting the place, but you know, that pulled out another, you know, a black man from uh, the police car uh, by the hair who was paraplegic, um, you know, again, highlighting the seriousness of the work that we're doing and why it is that we're doing the work that we're doing, why it is that we need to make sure that this part B along with part A um, continues to be imperative uh, in terms of the work. And then also, I know we haven't met in a while, the other one too that was really striking and needs to be, it needs to be stated. And of course this was with border patrol um, out on our borders uh, in terms of the Haitian community and, and how they were, were treated um, with police on on ho uh, border patrol police on 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 horse horses going around whipping people and you know running down women and children uh, and men of course but you know it, it's just I mean disgraceful horrific um, so you know continue to to just be befuddled and uh, know that the work that we're doing is is critically important. Um, I know it's national images, but these are the images that that then con that then um, you know stay within people's minds, and especially within the police minds, and then feel that they can treat people of color in that same way. So it's increasingly impactful. Um, so I just want to make sure that that continues to be you know center and focus in terms of the work that we're doing. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. And I apologize, I skipped right over members' reports. Was there anybody else that had anything that they would like to share? Okay, so we can move right into the LEAP presentation. Um, oh, Ms. Pat, Pat I'm sorry. Her hand. I just wanted to mention very briefly that a couple of weeks ago, uh, the co-chair and I attended the, the town council meeting regarding the new uh, standing committee. And although the meeting was productive, however, Mandy Jo was very divisive in some of her comments and she tried to divide BIPOC community, trying to put black resident against Asian resident. And we didn't allow that to happen. We have to, we responded back immediately. So I'm encouraging CSWG members and the public who are watching our meeting to uh, check the, the YouTube uh, regarding the particular meeting. It was two weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, and for other group members wondering about that meeting, I'm hoping that we can talk about that later um, this evening and talk about final communications as the group disbands in November. Um, yeah. 
So was there anybody else that had something they wanted to share for members report? Okay, so we can move right into the LEAP presentation. Um, Amos, I don't know how you would like to kind of format this. <laughs> Since we don't know each other, it would be great if we could introduce each other and maybe I can introduce each member of the CSWG and you guys can hear a little bit about why this work is so important to us. And then we'd like to meet your team before you present. Um, so I'll, I guess, I can go first. I'm really passionate about community safety and this work in general because I've been living in Amherst for the last 10 years. I have experienced different systems and I feel like you can work within systems for change by speaking out and advocating. And I'm excited to be a part of this with all of these leaders from the community. Um, who would like to go next? I will. So my name is Pat Ananibako. I'm a mother of five children and grandchildren too. I have lived in this town for more than 35 years and I'm, I'm very passionate about social justice issues. I've been advocating for issues of equity for a long, long time, both in our school system and in our community. Welcome um, to our invitees tonight. Yes, I'll go next. Hello everyone. Um, thank you all for coming out and helping us out with this important um, project. So my name is Deborah Ferreira, originally from uh, West Africa, Cape Verde Islands, immigrant to this country. Um, have two um, children, two black males, um, who obviously is one of the main reasons why I do this work because I feel that um, you know I need to make sure I do this work to safeguard their safety and all other children's safety. Um, but especially children who are BIPOC uh, it, within the Amherst community. I've been an Amherst resident for over 23 years um, and an, an attorney by day, um, you know, connected to UMass, uh, I work at UMass. And so, um, you know, this is very, very important to me and we need to make changes and the changes need to happen now. Well, they needed to happen yesterday, but especially need to happen now. Um, and obviously this is something I'm committed to, to a lifelong a journey of mine. Oh, Russ, you're muted. I'm Russ Vernon Jones, um, <clears throat> former elementary school principal, now retired. Uh, I think of myself as a racial justice and climate ju justice act activist. And uh, you know, in my years in the school system, I got to hear an awful lot about how various communities of color experience life in Amherst. Uh, and it's so clear that there need to be big changes. Um, and this opportunity to, in a sense, start with the police department, uh, I think has been a, a really, um, it's, it's been quite an experience to sort of dig into what what the community is experiencing and figure out what could make a difference. Um, and I'll just say it's been a real honor for me to work with, with this group and you know, so much appreciate the input that, uh, that LEAP is providing now. Thank you, Russ. Um, Alicia, I'm not sure if you're there and want to introduce yourself. Hello, I hope you all can hear me. I apologize um, as I cannot be in attendance for this entire meeting and I'm driving, but I'm happy that I can join you all for at least the first portion of this meeting. Um, and I really appreciate the work that has been done by LEAP and I'm excited to hear the presentation, although I, I was able to read through the report. Um, so my name is Alicia Walker. I have lived in Amherst for my entire life. Um, I have three children who I am also raising here in this town. Um, and I do this work because I um, have realized the, the impacts that policing has had and community safety in general has had on our community. And that if we were able to create things 
with the intention to serve portions of our community that have been underserved and underrepresented, the, the different changes that we can make and, and strives toward equity and towards making Amherst an actually inclusive and safe place for all community members. And so I, I'm really grateful to have been able to be a part of this work and to have been able to build these connections with the community and sort of work on building trust. And so I'm really looking forward to presenting our final report and sort of looking, um, holding the, count, the town accountable towards following through so that we can really make this an equitable town for everybody. Thank you, Alicia. Um, Amos, do you want to introduce your team? Um... Oh, I can't really it's can't hear you. <laughs> How about now? Oh, there you no. go. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, hopefully you can hear me now. Sorry. Um, Oh, okay. so, getting static again. Okay, how about how about now? Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm Amos Irwin, and uh, I will briefly introduce myself and the organization, and then turn it over to Lisa and Tom, who uh, are doing the hard work and will be doing the the presentation. Um, <clears throat> I'm Amos Irwin. I'm the program director for the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. And, you know, in brief, we work with police, judges, prosecutors around the country who really want to transform our country's approach to criminal justice in, in support of, you know, really trying to put communities on the forefront of making decisions, trying to uh, support restorative justice, trying to figure out how to roll back our, you know, our knee jerk, our society's knee jerk efforts to just punish, try to punish our way out of problems. So um, <clears throat> we have been very excited to work with the town of Amherst. And I personally have been especially excited. I was a student at Amherst College way back in the day. And, and actually, Ms. Ferreira, I was um, when, when you introduce yourself, I just suddenly remembered that, you know, back in 2005, I was uh, working with a, a man from Cape Verde in the Amherst Public Library, and I had forgotten about it until, um, until you introduced yourself. It just came back to me. So um, it's been great to kind of reconnect in some ways with, uh, with the town of Amherst. And, um, you know, I hope that, yeah, what we're presenting here can really be helpful because it's so it's, it's been wonderful to see what you all have been able to do just as, as volunteers. It's really impressive to see the work that, you, that you've been able to do to come together. So with that, I will turn this over to, to Lisa and to Tom to introduce themselves. Thanks, Amos. Um, I'm Lisa Tenenbaum. I joined LEAP recently. I actually came on board to help with this project, um, was my first introduction to working with LEAP. Um, my previous experience is I was a municipal attorney in California with uh, both a county council's office and an assistant city attorney in California. So I come at this from understanding how municipalities work, um, how the quote unquote sausage gets made at the town or city level. Um, and I also, I joined LEAP because um, both of my parents were police officers. So this has been a lifelong discussion about how to make policing better. I was actually introduced to LEAP. My dad's one of LEAP speakers. Um, so he's very aware of what they do. And we've, we've always considered that we could be doing things better. So I'm very excited to work on this project on your behalf and um, look forward to giving you some information that we pulled together for you. Tom. <laughs> Before I pass it back to Lisa, um, first of all, I want to say I really applaud you guys for what you're doing, and I applaud your persistence. Um, I am a retired police chief um, from the Dayton, Ohio area, and Deborah, that is where they pulled the young man out of the car by his hair, the paraplegic young man out of the car by his hair. Um, embarrassing. And uh, But I think that what we talk about today and what we'll talk about down the road uh, with what some of the things we've looked in and Amherst policies for their police department are going to be directly relevant to situations just like that. Um, I now speak for LEAP. I have for over a year, I believe. 
And I also run a nonprofit working with uh, at-risk immigrants in the Dayton, Ohio area. Most are from the continent of Africa, uh, but there are, there are some from others. And I'm very, very happy that one of my, one of my guys uh, is getting ready to graduate the police academy. He's a genocide survivor actually from Rwanda and he's getting ready to be a police officer here in our area, which is, which is wonderful. Um, I'm the father of a, a man from the Central African Republic. And so my, uh, my, my police career has had a, a, a much different, uh, it's been a much different experience than most guys like me. And I get to experience things as a father and as a grandfather that are very concerning. And this is why in my community, amongst my peers, I'm probably known as a advocate or someone who, who uh, I think they call me progressive. I push the envelope with my peers a little bit and uh, it's usually well received. But um, again, uh, from my, my experiences, you guys are on the right track. I've been inside policing. I know how it works and you guys are doing the right thing. And I, I appreciate every single one of you guys for standing up and doing what you're doing. Lisa. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just to give you a quick idea, I'm going to do just a quick overview of what's in the report um, and then really open it up to your questions and let you um, drive this discussion. So um, I'll start with the, the first part of the report was about the Massachusetts police reform bill and what it does. Um, to start with, it creates a police officer standard and training office, which is mostly led by civilians and will oversee the certification and decertification of police officers and investigate into police misconduct. Um, it also then went into a use of force requiring that an officer may only use deadly force if de-escalation tactics have been unsuccessful. It prohibited the use of chokeholds um, and it restricts officers from fly, firing at or into fleeing motor vehicles unless there's some serious exigent circumstances that require that. It also created a duty to intervene. That means that any officer witnessing a fellow officer use excessive force is required to step in and stop that excessive force and is also required to report it at the first opportunity to his superiors that he saw excessive force used. Um, the bill continues and has a ban on racial profiling. This one is sort of interesting in the fact that it doesn't, it doesn't do a very good job of saying what that ban will entail and how that will be effectuated. It does just say that the state attorney general can bring a civil action for injunctive or equitable relief to enforce if there is allegations that can be substantiated regarding racial bias. Um, so it, it seems like there's some opportunity in that area in particular for agencies to get out ahead of um, however they deem necessary to begin making sure that they're not racially profiling. Um, it also requires publicly reported data for the state, especially around uh, police violence and any injuries and or deaths caused by the police department and that that will be made publicly available. Um, and it did make some personnel records subject to the Your Public Records Act, although some items will still be shielded from public availability. So that's sort of just like a quick and dirty overview of that, that bill. It contained, it contained a lot of stuff that's very sort of interesting. It created a lot of, um, I'm sure you noticed, it created a lot of commissions and task force and special organizations to look further into policing. I imagine in the future, all those, all those different entities are required to report back to the state. So I imagine in the future, you'll see more legislation come out of that, um, those particular bodies. So I would really just recommend keeping an eye on what they're doing at the state level with this. Um, it didn't create a whole ton of action items right now at the local level, but it seems just reading the tea leaves, it's going to create new laws at the state level going forward. So keep an eye on it. Um, there is a post website already up, the post commissioners have already been chosen. So that will start to move forward and create those bodies which will then have oversight into police departments. And the next piece I'll just go into quickly was, um, we looked at your the policies of the Amherst Police Department. Specifically looked at use of force, consent searches and low level pretextual stops. Um, your, the use of force policy in particular 
needs some immediate um, concerns addressed. I'll, Tom will talk a little bit later about what those concerns are that he had very immediately reading that. Um, our recommendation is that entire policy needs to be wholesale rewritten. Um, it needs to be put into plain, understandable language. And it also needs to make use of force a last resort and not justify and use of force as a resort. Um, on consent searches, a warrant is always a better way to effectuate a consent search. Uh, there is vast racial disparity when, with consent searches through, through many studies and research, which we referenced in the report. Um, our recommendation is um, banning consent searches when a person is stopped solely for a traffic violation. Where consent searches of a place are deemed necessary, we would recommend, and I, I believe this was in your report as well, of using a form to document consent so that it's very clear. Um, from the former, the former municipal attorney and me also recommends that because it'll help with limiting liability and it'll receive much more credit in the eyes of the judiciary if they have a form like that. Um, a lot consent searches are not looked along favorably. People want judges want to see a warrant. So if you have a form that documents it and said this was allowed, that'll go a lot further. Um, on the low level pretextual stops, like the consent searches that also has a wide racial disparity in use, we recommend discontinuing those um, unless it's related to an issue that's an investigative issue. And there's an example out of Oakland of creating a checkbox, is this intelligent led stop, which helps you know limit those and, and create a more um, cognizable reason for those occurring as opposed to just your ta tail lights out. Um, and then the last thing we looked at was your police union contract. Um, it currently has a sunset provision that allows any discipline that occurred a year prior from not being considered in future discipline. We'd recommend removing that. Um, and then we also offered a recommendation to have the decision of an arbitrator appeal to the town's council. That comes with its own risks uh, and should be thought about very carefully. We'd be happy to discuss that more with you. And it probably is, is prohibited in implementation until you get a new CBA in 2022. But there's some thought that that could be, arbitrators are not often, they're, they're quote unquote impartial. So if they make a decision that is against what the values of the town are, if it's appealable to the town and the town holds your values, you may have a better chance of seeing the sort of discipline you'd like to see. And then lastly, we just had a, a couple general recommendations. Um, all of the policies included what we would call gendered language. Still, they said she, her he, him, we would just recommend modernizing that, um, just using officer or police. And then um, policies are only as good as their implementation. And if we recommend suggesting to the police department that there be a regular committee within the police department to review policies, make sure that they're modern, make sure that they're actually being implemented, uh, make sure that they're of the best quality that they can be. If a policy is just sitting in a binder and nobody knows what it says, it's gonna cause a lot of headaches when it needs to be invoked. Um, and the last thing is I recognize is probably, um, I, I emailed with Russ, but is, is I recognize it's a little touchy for your group in particular, but one of the things we wanted to recommend is that um, there's no police voices in any of the committees or processes that you were recommending. And we just, I understand the, the concern and the hesitancy around that, but because of the nature of this sort of discussion and the things that are happening, a two-way street that includes some of their perspective and that allows them to hear your perspective may be helpful going forward to get your policies implemented. And that's sort of the my seven minute overview of everything. And I, I we're of course very welcome to question. And maybe Tom, did you wanna jump in on the use of force thing now? You know, I can. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions or if you would, uh, we have a, quite a few more, you know, at the end of the day, I think one of the things we want to ask you is, would you like us to give a little bit more deep dive recommendation and what we think their use of force policy should look like? And um, we're willing to do that. And if you would like me to, I can just bring up a couple of concerns um, that that could relate directly to, to an incident that just happened in, in, in Dayton. 
that Miss Ferrara you spoke about. Um, or you guys can ask questions. It's up to you. Yeah, I'd like to hear the okay. information. Okay. So I'm going to pull up some notes I have here, which means I'm not going to be looking at the screen. So hopefully I don't do anything embarrassing like pick my nose because I won't be watching myself here. So, you know, one of the things up front is something that Lisa touched on, but the purpose and policy statements alone really set the tone for the entire use of force policy. And it prioritizes control and not, uh, not uh, humanity and de-escalation. Although it mentions de-escalation, the tone of it is prioritizing control for the officers. So we do have some examples. I know Camden, New Jersey, of maybe how to better uh, set the culture for the officers before they even get into the use of force policy, what their expectations are. Um, I would say a couple of the things that I thought were very problematic that these are things we'll be discussing, um, I think eventually with the police, is they have a continuum of force. <clears throat> and here I'm assuming that you guys have seen their use of force policy. If you haven't, it would probably be a good idea to look at it. Um, a few of my concerns are um, using contact controls when a subject is offering passive resistance. Um, so basically this offers officers the ability to go hands-on when there's no physical resistance or urgency. And not only have I worked in the streets, but I've worked in the hospital world. So I, I, I have seen where this can go horribly wrong and where it can go wonderfully right. And putting hands on people too early usually doesn't go well. So escort holds, which they actually use as an example, a lot of times can lead to fights or physical confrontation. So really, the officers are uh, authorized to I, sort of, the way you look at it, initiate the fight. Um, and I'll say a great example of this is the incident that just happened in Dayton. Uh, a paraplegic man refused to get out of the car. He even asked for a supervisor. There was no exigency, uh, but the officer backed by a policy, the union even came out, Dayton said, the officer acted within policy. So the, the officer, backed by policy, technically, pulled him out by his hair and onto the ground. Uh, now it's national news. <laughs> so um, if this is something they don't reapproach, um, their whole continuum of force idea, uh, they really need to be more specific. Uh, and, and, and in the approach and not so general. So also they don't really discuss what is enhanced physical or mechanical device or mechanical defiance in their active resistance section in this. Very broad. So essentially officers are authorized to use joint, use joint manipulations, batons, OC spray at this level, all of which could cause physical harm and quite possibly an altercation without any provocation. So the Dayton incident, for example, just use that, uh, could have also been categorized here. Essentially, there needs to be a lot more description of the officer's duty not to hastily engage in a much better definition of what enhanced physical or mechanical defiance is. A lot of times that is they refuse to get out of the car. Well, it's enhanced for them. So the duty to intervene, one of the things in, in Lisa's recommendation about just doing what the state uh, what the state has rolled out, um, their duty to intervene allows officers, if they witness someone using excessive force or acting inappropriately, they, they allow that officer through the end of their shift before they report it. So that in itself is a little bit problematic because you can have an officer who was uh, either not a good guy at all commit an assault earlier than the shift and you let him continue to work the whole shift and report it at the end of the shift. So to me, if you have an officer that is, uh, that is, that is acting, uh, uh, that is behaving in such a way that he shouldn't be on the street, he should be taken off duty immediately, not given the opportunity to work the rest of the shift for the possibility of that. Something else that I think you may be 
interested in. Uh, there's a couple of things that probably won't mean anything to you, um, but um, impact munitions, which is usually the beanbag, shooting somebody with a beanbag, which still is very painful, um, and pepper ball system. Both of them could potentially cause serious harm or death to somebody if not properly deployed. You know, they hit somebody in the eye, they hit somebody in the throat, even unintentionally. So they don't, they tell you not to aim at the head and throat, but it can happen. So their guidelines for when they can use these systems are very, very loose, to say the least. Um, for an example, one of them is for riotous or violent behavior, but they don't really uh, talk about what riotous or violent behavior is. Could officers consider a passionate protest as riotous behavior? Possibly. Or would you shoot somebody with a beanbag just because they were assaulted during an arrest? And what does assaultive even mean? Trying to push the officer away uh, or trying to hit the officer with a hammer? I mean, there's a big, big difference here. So this really needs to be better defined and because there could be a wide range of unacceptable officer actions taken that would literally still be within policy. The officers would be uh, within policy doing it. Um, and I think, and there are others, and I'll just say another one. One of the things that they talk about, and I, and I hope that there's more to it than this, but they review the, the officer in charge of uh, defensive tactics reviews their uses of force um, every year uh, with the uh, defensive tactics instructors to find out, you know, is there any policies or training issues? And I would recommend that each use of force, when I worked in the hospital, anytime there was an incident of violence and on the street, when I worked in uh, Miamisburg, Ohio, everyone was a big deal. And we completely broke it down at that time and sent it through several levels of examination to find out, was it right? Was it not? Do we need to look at policy? Um, what do we need to do with the officer? Do we need to look at our training? So not waiting until the end of the year to kind of take an, an, an overview of what you've done, use of force, but yet... Uh, uh, look at each one individually and take each of them very, very serious and make adjustments when, when you need to. And they don't use, if people don't claim to be injuries, they don't fill out use of force type forms, which they call a subject management form. It doesn't appear that they do it if someone doesn't claim injury, if it was just hands-on. And I think that's problematic as, as well uh, for them, you know, just accountability for themselves you know someone comes back later and says the officer twisted my arm and now I've had some tendons ripped but the officer didn't write a report uh, annotating anything happened because it was just hands-on and there was no uh, reports of injury at the scene so I think you know transparency wise that's a big deal to make sure you're recording all of that and you're investigating all of that and I think you know if I we're running the police department, I'd want to know that myself because I'd want to know uh, litigiously uh, if, we're, if we're getting ourselves in bad areas and we need to retrain some officers. So that is just a few things. Um, Thank you, Tom. I've talked too yeah. long. I'll let you guys ask more if you want to. Well, did you say that you have a, some model policies you would provide for us for use of force? I believe we do. I believe um, I'll double check, of course, but I'm pretty sure that we had some uh, model use of policies, model use of force policies we can provide you with. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Ms. Lisa. So um, thank you, both of you, for the presentation. And you um, stated that recommending uh, rewriting the APD policy, policies. However, the, isn't the, the union contract expires 2022. Mm -hmm. So in terms of timing, because well, we would like, you know, the, the, the policies were written, but because they're on, currently on contract, 
do we have to wait? No, you, you, I, don't, I don't want to speak specifically to what your town's requirements are, but generally speaking, a policy and a union contract are two separate things. And mm -hmm. policies can be updated regularly. These policies are currently dated July 2020. So they were updated after the last bargaining agreement was put into effect. So those are usually separate paths. They're not, they're not generally related. So you can update the policies at any point. Um, assuming there's not some specific quirk to Amherst that I don't want to speak to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, I had two questions about the report. Uh, one was under uh, consent searches. Mm -hmm. You recommend discontinuing consent searches, uh, but then the model language says, um, no operator should be requested to consent to a search uh, unless there exists reasonable position, suspicion or probable cause of criminal activity. That feels to me like an exception, a hole you could drive a truck through. I, I can see why, you, why it feels that way. And I think obviously with any policy, there's room for abuse, but I think when you see language for consent policies, they're much more specific. Um, that's a general recommendation, but the specific language that you would use when updating that policy would create a list of what those exceptions are, not just a broad exception, such as like, you know, criminal activity. It would say specifically under what circumstances that excuse can be used. So, so I can see the concern with it being too broad, but I think with the proper language, it would be limited to very narrow circumstances. Um, can you help us access that proper language now? Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean tonight, but I mean- Right, yes, yes. I mean, of course, we're happy to follow up on and making notes on what those issues are, yes. Okay. And I'm Amos, jump in if I'm getting anything wrong, obviously. Yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a great question. We uh, found the example policy on, on terms of consent searches, which I believe is from Providence, Rhode Island, last minute. So there may be some things that we uh, need to provide additional context to, like with the use of force policy, there was like something we wanted to add. So we say, oh, here's Camden County, New Jersey. It's a good policy, but should add in this other piece. So we may have to do that with the Providence piece, and I'm glad you're looking at it carefully. I will say, you know, when it comes to um, probable cause. Well, if you have probable cause, then you don't need someone's consent. So that's not an exception. Um, we'll have to, we'll have to look at the reasonable suspicion. Okay. And then my other question was under data collection, you include collecting data about religion, ethnicity, national origin, disability. How, how could a police officer collect such data appropriately? I'm sorry, I think we removed that. Uh, we, we caught that later on and, and removed it. Um, <laughs> so I, I think it's not in the latest draft. I know okay. I removed that in some place. I, um, but we should definitely remove it if it's not, if it hasn't been removed, because you're exactly right. You know, you wouldn't want to be asking somebody about those things in a traffic stop. Okay. All right. Well, if, if you'll work on some way to write this that around reasonable suspicion that you know makes it clear that a police officer who is you know thinks he thinks he's reasonable and is by nature suspicious could uh i mean it may have some technical meaning but i i, I worry about how it could be interpreted so i have a question and any of you can answer it so in in, in the work you guys are doing, has there been any community or communities that have um, started doing um, unarmed uh, poli police stop, um, traffic stop, like non-police traffic stop sure. that we're thinking are uh, honest? Not in the US. And so there are examples in, there are some jurisdictions that are starting to, they're, they're trying to look at this, like I think Berkeley, California, but 
none that we know of that have actually launched this. And while there are examples in other countries, there are lots of examples in Europe, but people have a lot of concerns due to the prevalence of weapons in the US, for example, that would make it more difficult to just directly apply those models. But that said, there's a, I, I think of a distinction between moving traffic enforcement and stationary traffic enforcement. And a lot of the situations, I mean, first of all, a lot of the stops that officers are making simply don't need to be made at all. It's not that you need, you would want a civilian to make those stops. You just don't need to make the stops at all. And then a lot of the encounters between a law enforcement and a motorist are someone who is, you know, there's an accident or an abandoned vehicle or something. It's stationary and someone has called in. And that's a situation where you either don't need an officer to respond or it could be a civilian responding. And that type of thing has been done. It's just the, the issue of, you know, civilians driving around and pulling people over. That we don't know of any models of in the US. Okay, the reason why, I, thank you. The reason why I asked the question is most of the encounter that BIPOC and marginalized groups encounter in our town has to do with racial profiling when we're driving. And that's what motivated me actually to join CSWG. I'm very concerned that in a couple of weeks, we'll be done with our charge. And it looks like uh, business as usual. If we don't have unarmed personnel to deal with traffic issues, just to have the police continue what they're doing and to tell them that you don't need to stop motorists randomly. It's not going to, it's not going to work. I'm very fearful of people who look like me. I'm fearful of my kids, my friends, my neighbors who look like me, that not much is going to change. The traffic stop I'm hoping is one of the key areas I hope that CSWG will accomplish. And I'm feeling very frustrated and discouraged. I just want to verbalize my feelings more than anything else. I'm, I'm scared driving anywhere in this country. It's not unique to Amherst. And then you. to, yeah. you know, the thought of being pulled over is very traumatic for people who look like me. Thank you so much, Ms. Pat. And, you know, I, it is very difficult to change a practice that has been going on for many years very quickly for that for the type of traffic stops that I think you are referring to, you know, it depends on the reason, but often when it's a thing like, oh, the tail light is broken, or really they just want to, they're just fishing for, oh, I think this is suspicious. That is the type of thing where we just want to stop that entirely. We don't need a civilian to pull the person over we don't need anyone to pull the person over. And so we are the, our recommendations would prevent the police from, from being able to pull the person over and saying, oh yes, this was, this was allowed under Amherst policy. Um, but your concerns are very important, very important. Uh, Mr. Bernie Jones and then Ms. Yeah, Barrera. Say to the leap folks, I, I appreciated your use of the word prohibit. Prohibit the police from making, you know, that, that, that seemed very useful. Uh, we are within the next few days uh, producing a final report in which we want to, we will uh, copy from the leap report and a cop, attach a copy in, of the leap report in the appendix. 
it would be very helpful if you could notify us each time you make a change uh, or give us access to the change history in some way in Google. I'm not sure how that works, but uh, from here on out, we are, you know, we've got to create a PDF, even though you're operating with a Google Doc. Understood. We'll be sure to sort of document that and alert you when we've made any substantial changes or, or pertinent changes. Even insubstantial ones. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ferreira. All right. So, I mean, you know, the report, I liked it a lot. Of course, I, I liked a lot of what you all included here in terms of, you know, a lot of the recommendations, you know, like the sunset uh, um, kind of a clause or whatever it is called um, is very important. I didn't even, you know, when, because their policy sometimes is so cumbersome to really pinpoint some of those things, it was really important to pinpoint that because how can you kind of really hold someone accountable if you're sunsetting what they've done within a year, you know? I mean, that that doesn't even make any real sense to me. But I think maybe something that might be a little bit helpful when I was looking at the report might be almost kind of like um, a summary um, in the beginning to kind of lay out some of the important portions of what you all are talking about. Because I hear what Ms. Pat is saying and I'm, and I'm in agreement with it, right? Which is, you know, we really want to know some cutting edge kind of, of information in terms of how to transform, you know, how the police are doing things. Because, you know, eventually we, we, we want to diminish the police and hopefully in the future not need the police in, the, in their totality, especially the, this version of, of the police that we have, right? So for me, it's kind of like, if there was like an executive summary in the beginning, like, okay, these are kind of the, 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 the summary of recommendations that we're making, and this is why, that might give us some context or some, some information right off the bat that will really kind of say what it is that, that, you know, that you're recommending and that will be useful in terms of us utilizing in our report and also communicating it to, um, you know, the town because there's gonna be a lot of resistance around this. And for us, you know, in terms of what we're talking about with, you know, BIPOC communities and BIPOC communities um, feeling safe, we really want a roadmap for making those changes. You see what I'm saying? And it's critical for that. And that's why it's kind of like, you know, how do we make sure that, that when, the, when, a, when a vehicle is moving, that we're not gonna, BIPOC people are not going to get stopped by someone who is armed, right? Because a lot of times when they're being stopped, they're being stopped because of racial profiling. And then what happens is that the communication from, from when they're stopped and when it goes awry happens very quickly. And here is this person with, with their, their gun on the side that makes you know, BIPOC us, me, right? My children, my son who's 17 and, and driving now, you know, totally afraid that something's gonna happen to him. You know, it's not something that we feel safe. Like I, like I, you know, like I've told to my colleagues, when I call the police, it's really under, I mean, it has to be like, I have no other choice, <laughs> you know, that, because for me, I don't see myself as, as getting help from the police. I feel it as, oh my God, what did, are they going to actually think I did something wrong? You know what I'm saying? That's how I always kind of interpret the, the interaction. So, so that's why it's critical for us to really kind of get some type of executive summary in, in, the, in the beginning to really kind of showcase the step-by-step -step roadmap in terms of how it is that we can make our recommendations so that the town can actually hear it and so that we can make some of these changes. And then, and then so I want you all to respond to that, but the second important part, which was Lisa, you had brought it up and I know that Russ had shared it with myself and Brianna who um, were the ones that were working on the report is that, I mean, I get it that it would be important to get the police, um, you know, their feedback in terms of some of the things that we're, 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 we're putting in this report. Um, and we actually did some of that with the part A portion, um, but with this part B, it's been very, you know, the, we, have, we haven't had time, you know, it's been really quick, we've had to do things, and for us, it's critically important for us to just get this information out. You see what I'm saying? And we have to get this out um, as opposed to kind of waiting or not do it just because we didn't get the feedback from the police. But I want to just kind of put it out there that it's just, 
we're at this critical juncture and we do want transformation um, as opposed to things staying status quo, which was obviously not anything that we wanted to have happen. And that's why we gave so much of our time to this. But, um, but yeah, in terms of my first question, um, is that something, oh, sorry, and I have one more. <laughs> um, in terms of the data collection portion too, that you all did put in like, you know, which was very good about sharing information. Another thing that would be important would be one, how do they collect that information, right? Because we had we had debates about that, you know. Um, are they just obviously self -identi like like identifying, eyeballing it type of thing? Um, because in terms of asking someone, what's your race? What's your ethnicity? Blah, blah, blah. That can be interpreted as discriminatory, you know. So what do you guys have any experience with that? And then two, how they should be um, providing that information too, you know, should it be a dashboard? Should it be, what's the way to really provide it to the community? Because transparency is not just collecting it, but how, mm -hmm. how do you share mm -hmm. it, you know? So if you guys can include some information around that, that would be also important. Sorry, I know I asked you all a bunch of questions, but I just want to make sure. <laughs> no, I, I, I think I got it. So let me, I'll sort of go in reverse order or jump around a little bit. Um, I totally appreciate the feedback that this was a time sensitive thing and you didn't have a time to include other voices and and totally understand. Um, it's again, it's my recommendation, <laughs> our recommendation. You, whatever you can implement, great. If not, totally fair. Um, as to the executive summary, can you sort of give me an example of, of how you're thinking that works, or or an example of where we could do that? And if you don't have an answer right now, I'm happy to have you email me sort of how you're envisioning that. I think I'm just not quite getting it. I yeah, what I'm thinking is like just the sum. You know how you you you. Mm -hmm. um, had everything set up uh, separately and stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? And there's each, just kind of like a, a couple of paragraphs in okay. the beginning where you just kind of, you know, summarize, okay, okay we, you know, this is the recommendation that we Got make on consent. This is what recommendation to, to kind of put it like in the beginning, you know what sure. I'm saying? But with that, like when you're doing it, to kind of put it as a, almost kind of like, if you do this, then this is the change that you can expect. You know what I'm saying? Almost kind of like what you were saying, like have it be very simple, very easy to read. And, you know, because with this even we're getting into like us, obviously we're gonna do it, but let's say someone who's really just trying to get that information right up front, right? And, and get what you're trying to say right off the bat. I'm, I'm talking for anyone, you know, off the street that's trying to read this and get, okay, what are they really saying? And don't wanna read, you know, 15 pages, <laughs> you know, a couple of, you know, right in the beginning portion, you okay, you're going to find the detail below, but this is what I'm, Got uh, it. this is my summary over sure. here uh, in, in simple terms, right? Mm -hmm. It would, it would be very helpful. Sounds good. Yeah. And then um, to the data piece, I'm going to look at Amos and see if he has any thoughts on the. <laughs> sure. And I, I will say on the executive summary, I think that's a very, Thank you very much for bringing that up. It's a very good point. Uh, we, we, there were a lot of things just because we were trying to finish this at the last minute that we could have done. Um, one, one thing that comes to my mind, I think we were thinking of the report in terms of the formatting, as far as if the police are looking at this, what is going to avoid their alarm bell? I guess, you know, if that, if that makes sense, it's how do, what is the best way to explain things so that they understand, oh, maybe there is a problem here with how we're currently doing things. And so, you know, if you start with an executive summary that says, ban this, prohibit that, rewrite this, right from the beginning, they're saying, oh my God, this is, they're trying to burn down the whole, the whole building, right? as opposed to, um, you know, these kind of explanation of the problem. And then hopefully by the end of that section, then they see, oh yeah, okay, maybe that does need to be changed. That said, if, you know, I wanted to explain that, but we are happy to, you know, to do an executive summary because if you're talking, as you said, if you're talking about people in the town reading it, yeah, they don't want to, you know, have to comb through a, 15 page report for what are the top five recommendations here. And I think it could be, it'll be an and both, you know what I'm saying? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. 
yeah yeah great because it was just shown on my screen that i was muted still but um no i'm just saying it can be an end both and for me you know for me still my audience is is the people you know what i'm saying i want them to be to know what we've done throughout this process so that's why i think kind of starting with that in the beginning and then with the police you know yeah they might be alarmed but then they're going to be like oh, oh wait 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 let me read more about it right <laughs> and it's below so it's not like we're hiding the ball because information is there you know yeah. um so if they try to say like hey wait a minute why are you where are you coming from this well on page blah 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 <laughs> there's an explanation sure. you know so sure yeah no thank you and on the on the data collection and transparency piece you're you're exactly right those are two very different things you know collecting it and then actually sharing it and we did not um so one of the problems is we didn't receive uh documents that showed you know we received the policies but not here's the form that they currently fill out in x and y situation so we don't have any uh a way to say here's what's you know here's what needs to change because we don't know what they're what they're doing now and the same goes with transparency we're not familiar with what is currently being done um so you know just based on lack of time and not having those specific things we didn't make recommendations in that area i think that you know we tried to put in some points about what other jurisdictions do as far as data collection and you're right it is just based on site because you don't want to be asking people sensitive questions and so i was glad that russ brought that up but we'll make sure it's not uh you know that those more detailed things are not included in the in the, in the report the question about transparency um i'm i'm not sure if there's an easy way to borrow best practices from another jurisdiction i'll have to i'll we'll think about that because you know it may depend on the computer systems that people are using or how does amherst share other documents um as far as can you know can it share the information from the police the same way it's just some an area I'm not quite as familiar with to be able to say, oh, these are best practices and can be borrowed from this other place. But it is a really good point. Um, so we can definitely try to come up with something. And I know that you're really under time pressure. So um, you know, it I, I know you mentioned that, you know, deadlines coming up in the next few days. I think that was you, Russ. So if you want to tell us kind of a specific time by which you need things, whether it's tomorrow or Monday, that will help us really focus on getting you as much as possible by the deadline. All right, so let's, let me check with Brianna. What's your sense of when do you really wanna have this to the town like council president? And, and and the can I just interject real quickly? I mean, they the, the town council hasn't, I know that they usually need to have things a week beforehand, but the other part is that they haven't given us a lot of time and we've been working feverishly to get everything done. So my thing would be to, to, to you know, to push them back. I mean, I know they, they, they need to get it, they usually get it a week before, but maybe this time they need to get it, you know, three days before, you know what I'm saying? Because it's just not fair to us, yeah. you know, for us to be able to have everything. Yeah, it is going to be a 40 page report and we do want them to read it before the meeting. So Yeah, I get but, it. I get it. But Russ, I'm sorry, so work, see, over work over the weekend, work over the weekend, just yeah. like we've had to do to, to get work done. You know, you know, do what you got to do. Read it. You better be ready, better be prepared, but do what you need to do. But my thing is we need to we need to be complete, though. We can't also rush it at the end, make mistakes or not have uh, leave do what they need to do in terms of information because we need to get it to them a week before. I'm sorry, you know, they, they get it three days before they need to read it. But go ahead, Brianna. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would I would say giving it to them by maybe Wednesday or Thursday or of next week to give them a whole weekend to read it would be good. I do agree with Deborah. Um, we still have to do the graphics and the picture part of it, which yeah, is probably- we've got a bunch of formatting to do after we finish text. Yeah. 
So I think that if we could have it by maybe Monday or Tuesday and we can plan to get everything to land by Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah. Um, and also just because the ADMHA still hasn't sent us their report. So that's kind of up in the air. So yeah, I think that had, will give us time to. Yeah, if we had things by the end of the day on, when, on Monday, I think we could, we could turn it around. Okay. And if you, have time to ask some municipalities about their dashboards before then i would i'm not looking for it in the report but i'd love to know you know what did it cost them to have it programmed and was there some canned software that they started with uh one of the things we're up against is apparently in the next year or two the police department is going to have to change their basic data system something about changes in state law and they're part of a collaborative with other, you know, whatever. And, you know, but my assumption is that any good data system, any new data system should be able to export data to an Excel spreadsheet. So if we had a dashboard that could draw data from an Excel spreadsheet, maybe that would, you know, make it workable even if they, if they have to change their data system. Uh, but let me ask one other question. Are you aware of any places that have tried having police officers take their best guess about somebody's race and then offer drivers the opportunity to correct it if they want to? I thought I had read this somewhere and I can't find it. I, I will say that uh, in my experience with officers that I've worked with in my region and across the country, I've never heard of that. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad idea or it couldn't be done. I'm just saying that I have a the direct answer is I have not heard of that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Russ, I wanted to make a comment about the data collection because different data Data is only as good as two things. One, what the officer inputs, mm -hmm. and, and two, what officer or dispatcher inputs, and two is the type of system you have and what its capabilities are. So if I were going to make a recommendation to you guys that if they are going to build out a new system in the future or they do need to remodify some of the things they're doing now, I would say it might be a good idea if you guys gave them an example of this is the type of information that we would like to see on an Excel spreadsheet to be trans, you know, available for the community to look at. And they may not have ever adjusted their current uh, database to be able to do that, but they may be able to. So, um, or at least in, into the future, when they're looking for new, they know what they need to be compliant with what the community would like. So I, I would probably come up with something on your own and say, these things are important to us. We, want, we think they should be transparent and immediately uh, available upon request. Ms. Pat? If I may, um, I think, Leap, you guys have done tremendous work in a very short period. I truly, truly appreciate the effort you got put in here. As a black woman, I do not trust that APD will ever change because there is a pattern. In 2004, the select board then created a committee, racial profile, profile committee to come up with one page that police officers could use when they stop uh, motorists. I, I attended some of those meetings. It didn't go anywhere. There were police officers, there were personnel from APD who attended the, the meetings. It was very intimidating just to have BIPOC and white allies and police be in the same room. It wasn't very productive. There were two meetings that went on. After the meeting, you will see BIPOC folks, marginalized folks, discussing what we're supposed to discuss. 
at the meeting. The short story was a form was produced, APD never implemented it. It was never used. And it, you know, the, the parent who championed the racial profiling form, Jackie Hazard, through the town, town meeting at the time, it was never done. I do not have faith you know, that anything will change. But you know, it's a good exercise that we're doing here. The fact that the police will still be in charge of traffic really worries me. I won't lie to you. So on that note, um, what are your thoughts about camera? Because I know surveillance is controversial in my community. So I want you guys to weigh on that. And also, um, I wasn't sure if you guys, you know, you know, plan to wear on Crest program. The fact that it's not going to be 24 seven programming will just lose credibility. If we're not going to have a 24 seven Crest program, it is set up to fail. It's not going to work. The data that is used to come up with part-time Crest uh, scheduling, we did not account for BIPOC folks and marginalized folks who do not call the police. It will be for me to call police, it will be extreme. I almost never, never do because I don't trust the police. And I come from family of police. My uncle is a police officer. I have a lot of cousins who are police officers and still it's the blue code. I do not trust, this is not about race. To me, police is scary for me. Thank you. Amos, do you mind if I take part of that and then I'll, I'll uh, let you answer. Uh, I want to take the camera part. Sure. And then and then I'll let you answer the, the last part of that. Now I've forgotten because I wasn't going to address it. <laughs> so, uh, um, so the cameras, Pat, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about surveillance cameras, not body worn cameras, but surveillance cameras that police put out in the community. All of them. Is that what you're talking about? Everything. Is that what you're yeah. talking about? Yeah. Okay. So in, in Dayton, Ohio, um, the police, uh, in order to, they ran the data for the city and, and wanted to find out where are the most the stolen cars? Where's the most violent crime happening? And they put cameras up in specific areas without partnering with the community and getting the community's buy-in or blessing for it. And what happened was it was a huge pushback and now the cameras are gone because they put them up in communities where we had people that are undocumented. A lot of people that I work with uh, were very, very concerned and or they put it up in uh, African-American communities. And they thought of all the communities in the Dayton area, why are you putting these cameras up? The optics were horrible and they didn't consult with the public. And I actually called the chief myself and said, are you getting this feedback? Because this looks really bad. And they realized they had not consulted the community. They took the cameras down. So I think cameras is a broad term and typically I would say I'm not for them unless the community says, you know, for example, we know that we've had children, somebody's trying to take children from this bus stop and we want cameras on this bus stop to see who's driving around, who's trying to prey on our children. And it's a community buy-in effort. Then I say, you know, there's always exceptions where maybe that could be appropriate but not without the community's buy-in and blessing. So just typically setting up cameras to read people's license plates or uh, uh, catch people uh, walking around, uh, though popular and though they can justify, you can justify it depending on what angle you're, you're pushing. If you're not living and working in those areas, it's not justifiable without people that live in those areas or buy-in. So. That's my take on cameras. And, um, and one other thing, Pat, I wanted to tell you that you're right. Change is going to be tough. And change is not going to happen without you and, and the rest of the individuals on this group who are taking a stand that is 
above and beyond what most communities are doing. And so I wish that, you know, you could, you know that there's not a rosy picture where there's going to be very little effort. It's just going to happen tomorrow. It's going to be tough, but I appreciate you guys taking the time and, and we will do our due diligence uh, for best practices around the country to spell out the things to the police that we've talked about here tonight. We're going to advocate for the very things that we, we talked to you guys about. So we, we, we will have your back in those areas. So Amos, I'll turn it over to you. I hope you remember what the third question was. Can I just interject real quick um, on body worn cameras? Cause you said you were concerned about all cameras um, of the state of Massachusetts police reform bill section 104 of that bill addresses body worn cameras. They're supposed to be a task force created to analyze and do an overview of what best practices on that would be going forward. So I just advise you to keep an eye on the state legislation and what comes out of that task force. Thank you. And I would advocate for body worn cameras because I think those, uh, those change, I have seen personally when we had cameras in the car, it changed officers behavior because they knew they were on camera and like the incident in Dayton, though I've gone back to that a few times, but Deborah, you brought it up. So mm -hmm. um, that incident was caught on a body worn camera. And so I think those things are important. But that, can I just interject before Amos comes in, in terms of what you were saying, that's exactly what I was going to talk about is the fact that, um, you know, in that incident in Dayton, Ohio, I mean, they were using body worn cameras. But yeah, and still, they still did that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So imagine if they weren't using it, what else they would have done, right? Maybe that man would have lost his life if, if they weren't using the body worn cameras. But so, yeah, it's a good thing. And I think, you know, obviously they should have it. But in terms of what Ms. Pat and others on this committee has been talking about, this working group has been talking about, it's just like, it, it has to be a, all of these things that you all are recommending, plus the things that we're recommending, for there to be change, but it's the how, right? How is that going to happen? Because, you know, we, 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 we've had things for years, you know, where we've tried to have the APD and, you know, other, other agencies within town that are, you know, just kind of, you know, white focused and not dealing with all inclusivity of all other groups. So it's, it's that part of how does that happen, right? We can make, I mean, we know that, right? You all are making all these great recommendations. We're making a lot of recommendations, but are they going to take it seriously? So for me, the other part that would be good, you know, when you all are thinking about the fact that you've worked with a bunch of other um, uh, departments, you know, nationally is maybe citing, you know, one that has been successful and the how. That's why I keep on talking about the roadmap, right? Because the thing is, is that, you know, most often, all of these recommendations, all of the, 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 the great ideas that, that we have and you all have, don't come to pass. You know what I'm saying? Because there's that resistance, it's entrenched um, because of the history, right? Because of the history of why, the, how the police were, were, were created, which was to bring back fugitives from uh, African fugitives back into slavery, down south. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, when you have that kind of history, it is very difficult to change it even today in this day and age. We're in 2021, it's going to be in 2022. We're still dealing with a lot of the same things from the inception of when the police were created, you know, which were the, the paddy patrols and all of those things. Um, so yeah. I want to pose that to you all. Culture. That's how. That's, that's how it ultimately has to change is you have to have a leader which you may have now, and a leader supported by a town and a community that will be able to influence and develop other leaders and spread that influence through his troops and to not only uh, uh, accept these type of recommendations that are based on what the community's uh, desires, which police do work for the community. I mean, they're pros, professionals that are supposed to serve the community. So that's what it's supposed to be about and uh, who uh, a culture that will embrace that. And so if you don't have that culture that runs through the department, you're exactly right. A lot of the things that you're talking about right now are going to be very, very difficult to see realized. 
I'm sorry to that's the, that's you know, jump in mind. quickly, Tom. I, I have to go in like three minutes. So I just want to try to quickly address uh, Ms. Pat's question about the Crest stuff. And, and um, you know, I, I think that I'm glad that you brought this up because we definitely don't want a part of our recommendations to undermine the, the program. And you're right that, you know, this issue around 24 seven, this is a major, it's an important issue to, to raise. We, since we submitted the, this preliminary report, we received some more information that will be helpful in estimating how much calls will increase. It's a very rough estimate because it really depends on how much faith people have on the program and things like that. But that will enable us to add in a, a factor for how many more calls would come in through basically a direct line. Like, oh, okay, I don't have to call up the regular dispatch center. I can call the responders directly. And so I have, you know, a, a trust that that will, uh, you know, that that's okay. And so, so we, we have a way of adding that in. We will be adding it in. This was just the preliminary report. Um, and we, even with the, you know, even with the current scenario, if there's nobody responding between, you know, three and 7 a.m., um, we, there, there would be somebody uh, available on the phone so that there is at least that level of, you know, can around the clock care of some type, even if it's not available in person at 5 a.m., that there is a person available on the phone at 5 a.m. who can then say, you know, here is the time at which someone can come out there. It'll be a few hours. Um, so we can we can certainly talk about that further. Um, and I'm so sorry that I have to jump off, um, but that I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's a really important point. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I have a, a bunch of follow-up questions. Thank you uh, so much. Oh, they're leaving. Oh, they're leaving. Yes, Lisa and Tom, I believe, can can stay. Okay. <laughs> and if Is that okay? Yeah, Lisa and I will stick around. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you. So, um, where do I begin? I will just name the elephant in the room. Our town historically is known for putting issues that impact BIPOC and marginalized people on the back burner. It's never a priority. The fact that we're not going to have 24 seven alternative community policing is a no uh, starter for me. The fact that we're not going to have a separate dispatch center for the alternative program. It's not going to work. I can tell you right now, people who look like me will not be calling 911, even though it's the, the way the report is written, uh, communication center. No matter what we call it, people call it 911. It's not going to work. It's about what we're putting priority in this town. MS is well resourced. We have the resources to fully implement the recommendation that we made for CREST program. Another issue, as I was reading the excellent work you guys did, like changing the title of the CREST director to CREST coordinator. What the heck is, excuse me, what on earth is that? Why are we changing the title from program director to program coordinator to reduce the salary? I think the CREST director should have same level of salary like the APD chief. The, chief, the, the head of a department. I did not read anywhere in that report that says CRES is going to have a different department. Why is that? This is something that affects BIPOC folks. Okay, this is about reparation work as well. So I am really um, feeling that I've wasted so many months doing this work and it's almost like not much is going to change. 
And people who know me know that I'm a very optimistic, positive person, but the more I try to be positive, the more it's like, no, don't kid yourself, man. To have a part-time press program, to change the title to program coordinator doesn't make any sense to me, except to say, to, to, to put little resources for the most uh, marginalizing in our town. I'm not happy at all. I'm not. I will not be calling 911 for help if that's what we're, what we're going to be getting. I will not be calling that. So, Pat, I will try to address. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Russ. Oh, Miss Pat, um, I, I agree. There's plenty to talk about about the um, the coverage and what happens during the wee hours of the morning and all. But I'm not clear what you're referring to about changing the title because I got an email from De from Jennifer, I think today that describes the, has the posting for a director of community okay. responders, community safety I, and service. And we got the salary up to one step on the scale. So I read something in, um, in the document about pro press program coordinator. Was that updated? I, I read that like last week. So in but, some type of report that we received for Amos at some point, it said that he had never, that we had given the program, it's in the job description one, right? And he had said he hadn't heard of any communities that had them as program directors as opposed to program coordinators. And it wasn't part of the recommendation page, I don't think. So no, I, it I, wasn't... I don't think it was part of the recommendation page. It was, uh, When I saw that it was on the job description itself, he had sent an email about his thoughts about the job description. Okay for the Crest director. And all he said was he hadn't seen it listed as a director before. He had only seen it as a coordinator. It has to be director. <laughs> it, it has is. to be. Well, it is. It is. Yeah, it has to be. Because we're happen. hoping that a BIPOC candidate will get that job or marginalized uh, 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 candidates will get that job. It has to be program director. Thank you for clarifying, Ms. Moisten. Um. Mr. Vernon Jones, is it okay if I just ask a quick question about um, the the reform bill and the record sense setting? Oh, sure. I know that you had your hand up. Um, Lisa, I was wondering, so in under the contract part where it talks about record sense setting, it's kind of unclear. It says this language should be removed in order to ensure appropriate accountability based on patterns of behavior. I was wondering if it would be possible to talk about how we would go about doing that. Would that be something for our resident oversight board to do? Is that something that the town manager has to advocate for? Like just action steps so that we can have a, a plan to make sure we can yeah, follow that, it through. So that language actually comes from the CBA so the collective bargaining agreement. So that I think you're correct that the town manager is the best path to go forward to have that particular thing changed. And that that's then tied to that collective bargaining agreement and won't be able to be amended until the 2022 and the new agreement. But the path forward is whoever's on your bargaining team at the bargaining table with the police union. Okay, so that I, I think if we could just add that in the report, that sure. would be really helpful just so Absolutely. we know who to like, go to to follow that through. And then I just had one quick question about um, the post in regards to the training that they're working on right now. Were they tasked with creating new training or are they adding to the existing training? So it's complicated, um, a little bit of both. It, it post is like, post is new for the state of Massachusetts. You didn't previously have post. They're tasked with overhauling how all of police everything is done. So I imagine they'll be borrowing a little bit from what's existing to not reinvent the wheel, that seems like a really big scope, but they are gonna be the final stop on what certification and D for certification for police throughout the entire state of Massachusetts looks like. Wow, and yeah. in regards to the process of doing that, are they going to include the community and other police agencies? Like how are they gonna go about making that change so through meetings or? So um, they have a broad 
they have broad authority. They have really broad authority. First of all, the post commission for the state of Massachusetts is not made up mostly of police officers. It's made up mostly of the public. Um, and it's, it's different appointees, either from the governor's office, the state ledge, the AG's office. So these are, these are civilians tasked with oversight. Some of them can have past police experience um, so that they know what they're talking about. And then their purview is, is pretty much all of policing. So they're tasked with, um, they were given finances to do this. They were given subpoena powers. They were given investigatory powers. Um, so they can do whatever they would like as far as the legislation that's enabling them is written. So um, again, keep an eye on them. If you have questions, they now have a website open. So if you wanna say, hey, we'd like to be involved in your process. We'd like the public records on what's going on. That should all be available to you. I think if possible, it'd be really helpful if you could talk about um, who the post is compromised of in our report, just because I do think we do get a little bit of kickback from our resident oversight board in regards to membership, not including police or former law enforcement. So it'd be good for that to be included. Sure. I have a question for Ms. Lisa, and that is if you could um, dig further regarding the racial bias, is that a law now in terms of prosecution? if somebody were to fight lawsuit against police mm -hmm. in Sorry. terms of the state, state, the new state uh, bill. Yeah, so, um, so in the state bill, it's saying racial bias. I, I, it doesn't really explicitly say how that's gonna operate. So I would imagine somebody would go to the state AG, whether a citizen, whether a fellow officer um, and, and ask for the state AG to investigate, but it's, it's seriously like two sentences in the entire bill and it doesn't explain what's going to happen. So um, if I see anything else, I'll of course let you know, but it was really, really light on that area. And then I would um, also suggest following up with the state AG if that's something you're concerned about happening or how it's going to be effectuated because it, it didn't, it wasn't any more clear than, than that. Thank you. So the reason why I asked that question, I think it would be very important for this you know, the um, standing committee that will replace CSWG, or even in, in our report for us to highlight this and for us to do some public education to let people know, because I, I didn't know about this. If, if, if people who look like me and marginalized people feel that they have another recourse, because I can tell you right now, fighting complaint locally has not worked. Right. It doesn't get investigated. It's not transparent. But if people know that they are being targeted racially and they can, you know, go to AG, you know, it will give power back to people, I think. So I think it, it will be up to us in Amherst to make sure that people are aware of this, especially my community. Thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure um, to include that specific language and I'll look and see if there's any further explanation of that, but it really, it, and that it can help guide you in the future, but it really was light at the moment. Thank you. Guys, if we could step back to the union uh, talk here just for a second, I wanted to give you guys some insider information that may be able to help you when the union contract comes up. I've been a part of contracts as a patrolman, and I've also been part of contracts as an assistant city manager. So I've been at the extremes at both ends. And never have I heard of, or anybody I've spoken to that's dealt, con dealt with contracts, while they're discussing the union contract, what's the impact on our community? What's our community think about this? Really, in your case, you have the town and you have a police union and they have bargaining chips on the table. The police union wants a raise, they want these benefits, they want these clauses put in, like you gotta drop all of our, uh, uh, all of our uh, discipline after a year, you can't use it again. And then the city has, we don't wanna give a raise, we wanna make sure we have management rights. And, and so there's a give and take of these bargaining chips without ever thinking about how does this give and take of these bargaining chips, um, how is that going to benefit our community? So probably this, you uh, you don't uh, you can't use our discipline against us after one year. I would guess was a bargaining chip at one time that okay we'll give you that, 
but we're going to have to give you a 1% versus a 3%. And so the community, I never heard, nor have I ever, it ever crossed anybody's mind, wow, how's this affecting the community? What would they think about this switcheroo in the bargaining? So that's what happens, typically. Um, Lease has been in contracts for, before, too. And so I would encourage you to, again, what Lisa talked about, your influence with the town manager and making sure that community had a, uh, a voice when these matters that do directly affect the community were laying on the table. So if that helps. Thank you. Yeah, and I just yeah. want to echo what Tom said because um, the bar bargaining concept is so powerful and so few people pay attention to it because when it comes on a town agenda, it's not a big red flag of we're going to the bargaining table about these things and what that means. So I'm always encouraging people in my sort of no, no zealot like a convert world of um, read your town's agenda. I mean, obviously you're all very active, but tell your friends, read the town's agenda, pay attention to what's going on. And it is unfortunate that a lot of the bargaining at least in California, I don't want to speak to Massachusetts laws, but in California, there's a lot of, um, it, it's a closed session exemption that a lot of the discussions regarding contracts don't have to be made public until the contract is effectuated. Um, but just keep an eye on it. And the other way that you can get ahead of bargaining and what's in the bargaining agreement is to look at the town's budget and where the money is going. That'll often give you a big idea of how that money is being spent. And a lot of the way that that money is being spent is baked into those collective bargaining agreements. So it's kind of a complicated process. If you have questions about it, I, I did this for a long time. I'm happy to answer them about that. Um, but it, it, it can be really powerful to tell your community what's important for you, them to not give away at that bargaining table. And Tom's exactly right that we do this back and forth horse trading to get to a middle ground, to get to a consensus. And usually it is money versus, you know, certain fringe benefits. And, and so if you tell your community, hey, this sunset clause is a problem and here's why, and your town manager buys in, it'll make him easier to go to the bargaining table and say the community is not behind this. Thank you. So there's a difference between a town manager arguing and having the town's best interest in mind uh, financially. You know, oh, I don't want to give up too much because we have only have this much in our budget financially thinking that way and giving up towns, the town's interest in mind when it comes to uh, human uh, everyday, every, everyday life quality, which sometimes things can be given away that will affect your life quality, but not maybe affect the town's budget. So maybe they're not really seeing it. And so if you have, if you have some influence in there, then you might be able to help direct that. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones. I just wanted to say thanks to things that uh, Lisa, probably you wrote in the report, we will certainly have that in our report to the town. And we got a lot of people reading our last report. And we also have written in that the new at resident oversight board that we're pushing to be created must be consulted prior to and during police contract negotiations. So we've got a, we've got a shot at it anyway. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Implementation is where the challenge is. Big yep. one, yeah, implementation. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Did anybody have any more questions for um, the members of LEAP? Well, Lisa and Tom thank, and Amos, I know he's not here. <laughs> thank you guys so much for your work. Um, the report was great and we really appreciate you guys working on such a tight timeline to help us put together this report and go about making some change in Amherst. Thank you so thank much you for so having much. us. Yeah, thank we're you. honored to be able to even be part of this discussion with you. So thank you. And thank sorry, so just much. before you all go, you, uh, just saying, so Monday, by the end of the day, yeah. just get together. Awesome. Yep. Let's, let's make sure. I, actually, let's, right. <laughs> let's check. Lisa, Tom, where are you in the country? I'm in New Orleans. Oh, wow. Today, oh, wow. I'm in Southeast Ohio. But in the last couple of weeks, I've been in Maui and Houston, wow. Texas and wow. Dayton, Ohio. So wow. I've been, if you I could see me, I'm very tan right now. I just didn't want it end of the day in Maui, you know. I mean, we <laughs> that's right. End of the day in New Orleans is fine. Yeah. <laughs>
It's Perfect. been an honor. Thank you guys Thank very, you. very much. Thank you guys Thank so much. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Take care. Okay. I thought that was good. <laughs> yeah. Thank it's you. not easy for them to be able to post something for us. And it's very short timeline. Time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's amazing what they produced in a short yeah. time. Yeah, they really did. And I want to thank three of you for working so hard, you know, to produce something that will be presented to town council. So I know it, it's been very busy for you guys. Thank you. Yeah, well, a lot of it goes to Russ. I mean, yes. it's been <laughs> Russ, fabulous. Yeah. He's been doing a lot of the they, kind of. They, they guide me. They guide and me and I write. <laughs> And then sending it to Brianna and I, and then we edit and put in comments and changes and all this other stuff. So it's it's a team effort for sure. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Pass off the rough, rust. And just so you all know, this this group has this committee has um, moved me to get Microsoft Word, not Google Docs. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. Um, I'm revisiting our agenda now and I'm also okay. looking at the time. So it's 709 and we still we still need to look over um, the report for part B and look at the updated pages 15 through 29. Um, Russ, would you be able to pull up that now? Or maybe sure. I can let me Sure, I can I will be back momentarily. Uh, let's see. Do I have screen sharing? Yes, I do. Okay, so let's. Um, all right. So again, what what are we thinking uh, about Brianna? Like in terms of once we get the information from Leap, let's say on Monday, as long as we can get things to you, or, which obviously is the three of us kind of working mostly on it. Like um, by Wednesday, then that'll be good. To yeah, I think Wednesday would be good. But what about in terms of the um, graphics and the color and all of that? So I'm thinking if we can get everything, if you guys can get everything to me by noon on Wednesday, I can probably have the report done by 5 p.m. Wednesday and two council members by then. Um, I don't know it, what the group had in mind for like pictures and gra graphics or if I should just use some of the content from before, if there's anything new you all want to send me. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it would be good to have some pictures, but I don't know if we have anything new. I could reach out to um, Art Keen, maybe from the Indie. He had provided mm. pictures before. Maybe yeah, that would be good if you could if you could reach, out, reach to, out to yeah to Art and see if there's new pictures that we could use. It would be great to have other graphics. I mean, other pictures. Are we going to see the the report before it gets sent to the town council? Asha will, if we want to give feedback to the subcommittee. Because I'm not, you know, I don't think I've read the um, updated draft yet. I'll try to read it. Well, what, what I would propose is that we, let's see, this is Thursday. Can we set noon Saturday as the deadline for? Sure. Yeah. If that, if we had stuff from the community Sa safety working group by noon Saturday, yeah, then we could incorporate that. And I think what's what we also need is, I don't know whether it's a vote or just a decision by consensus that you're going to authorize our, the three of us to make revisions. Uh, based on input from this group and from LEAP. Um, and that, in other words, we'll sort of approve, tentatively approve it tonight or something, and then, but you'll authorize us to make changes and, and then not see it again before it actually goes out. Is that, is that going to be workable? I like to yeah, say, like, like say it before it goes out. Not that I would add any additional well, I think it's I think it's in it's in pretty it's in good shape right now I mean it's actually yeah go ahead. as of this afternoon it's it's a report that that could go out except that we don't have the ADMHA stuff on the the um, creating an anti-racism culture on the police force are they supposed to come tonight 
Yeah, so they were supposed to come tonight, but um, the person presenting got COVID and his two children got COVID. Oh, um, we, yeah, we responded and requested the report, but have not heard back yet. We're hoping to get it by tomorrow so we can work it into the report. Okay. But, so, so, you know, the reason why, um, and you guys have done tremendous work and time and energy and everything, is around the traffic control. If LIP is saying that, it's never been tried. They're just recommending for the police to stop track, you know, like traffic stop, period. I mean, what are people thinking? Because it's shocking to me tonight. You know, I assume that some, com you know, some communities have started doing, doing that. Well, what I, what we did so far is we took the uh, prohibiting consent searches, prohibiting low level pretextual stops. We took those out of the traffic section and put them in the police department policies section so that they could be implemented uh, immediately. And what that does is leave the traffic control and enforcement section, basically the creation of the unarmed um, group. Um, and I, I don't know, you know how, how we feel about that, but that's, that's the way it's currently set up in the report. So what, what I don't want to see happen, you know, given the history of town council, okay? If LIP is saying that, there is no such community that have, you know, have alternative, you know, tra traffic control personnel. I would like to see a language that state that APD that, you know, should not do any traffic stop. Because without a strong language like that, and if, you know, the town manager or the town council or, you know, APD refuses what we're proposing. What is the point of proposing it in the first place? I don't want to recommend something that is not going to get implemented. Is it realistic? If we still want to push the idea, we could do it. It's ultimately what I would like because I help, um, you know, craft some of the language there. Well, I mean, I think that's where I was trying to get at. I'm hoping that when they do the revision and they put the kind of like summary of their recommendations in the beginning, it'll be clear that that's what they're communicating, right? That no, you know, that the police not do pretextual stops and, 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 and those types of things right off the bat. I think that would be helpful. I mean, in terms of the fact that no municipality is seemingly no municipality has had kind of unarmed traffic um, folks uh, do that work, even though we do know that like Berkeley and others have had, you know, a version of it, right? Like they go, they, they do a bunch of stuff without kind of falling short of doing this unarmed group, even though there's been recommendations, but they haven't put it in place, you know? Well, Berkeley actually, so, Berkeley actually voted it. Yeah, and voted it, exactly. Been able, haven't been able to implement it because state law doesn't permit it. Okay, so that so that's the thing. So the thing is, it's been voted, and and, and that's what I'm saying. It's been short of like implementation. So I I don't think it it it's a bad thing for us though to recommend it. You know what I'm saying? And then still still put it out there, even though others haven't been able to, you know, make it happen, right? Because the thing is, is that all of what we've been trying to do has been out of the box for for Amherst anyway, you know what I'm saying? I know that obviously for Crest there's been other versions of community responders, but we have a version that's different from other versions in other municipalities, right? But we still move forward with it because other municipalities did contracted folks, they did this and they did that. Whereas we wanted, you know, a, a, this, this department to be created that would be the Crest program. So, so my thing, my opinion would be, yes, you know, let's take a lot of what LEAP is recommending, right? As, and then hopefully that will have that backing, but still let's go further and recommend what we 
need to recommend based on everything that we've researched and what's specific to Amherst and what we think would, would be helpful for communities, especially BIPOC communities here in Amherst. So thank you um, for saying that. What I'm trying to get at is, and I'm imagining what people who look, look like me will feel after CSWG end, it would be nice to share with people who look like me and say, guess what? One of the accomplishments with CSWG, hopefully, is that we're recommending no more traffic stop by the police, period. I mean, is that practical? Is what mm -hmm. I was, you know, I would, I would like that language in our document. No more police traffic, you know, uh, traffic stop by APD. Ms. Pat, there I, are- I can see, you know, my people feeling relieved that they will not be driving and be fearful that somebody will pull, pull them over for you know, stupid excuses. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones, then Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, I, what we are recommending, and I'm, it's not actually in here yet, but I have a proposal to add it, is that the police part, the, police be prohibited from making stops for a whole list of things, broken lights, turn signals, storming, you know, et cetera, a whole lot of things. And that if the police department won't make that as a policy change that the town council voted as a bylaw. I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether we can get that, but I think that we, we can't just leave it up to the police department being helpful. I think we got to have have some teeth behind it. I can't see saying no traffic stops ever. There are there are people who drive 25 miles an hour over the speed limit. There are drunken drivers. There are people who hit somebody and then flee the scene of an accident. I think we we need the police to be able to stop those folks. Yeah, and but police so have stopped people of color who are not speeding just because right. of their race. That's what we have so to say. That's what majority of the stopping is. When you get pulled over, you are told you are speeding. Even in neighborhood roads. How can you be speeding in neighborhood roads? I mean, we need to use very strong language, at least to, to make our time worthwhile with this group. It has to be, you know, making a list. APD will find other loopholes to, to stop people. I mean, of course, I would like, I would actually like to put it the other way around. No traffic stop except for drunk driving situation, accident situation. You know, speeding is very arbitrary and it's, it's um, subjective. I worry about putting in the language of speeding because that's how we get stopped, people of color. We get stopped many, many times for the claim of speeding. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, just to kind of follow that, I mean, I guess we do need to find a way to, to, to communicate that because, you know, I do see what Russ is saying in terms of like, just saying no stops at all, there are gonna be those times, especially right now, right? Because it's not like the police are going away tomorrow. You know, we've, we've recommended reduction of the police and so on and so forth, you know, starting now and, and to continue on, but for a time being, especially for situations where there is violence or, you know, egregious criminal conduct, like drunk driving or a hit and run or a, an egregious accident or something like that, you know, for now the police need, they'll need to make a stop, right? Or, or control that situation in one way or another. Um, so it, it's the how to kind of communicate it. Um, and, you know, it might be what you're saying, like no stop, however, uh, you know, these would be some of the circumstances where it would be allowed, maybe that's the way. Because if we do the list the other way, it could be, it could mean that they'll they'll say, well, well, it doesn't fall under this list, so therefore I can do it. You know what I'm saying? So 
but we have to, you know, like you were saying, Miss Pat, it's not like we want to make recommendations too that just fall flat. Yeah. That no one's going to get behind yeah. also, you know, and especially right now. Um, so that's the thing that we need to make sure we communicate it in a way that it makes sense. I mean, thank you. I mean, I, you know, I appreciate Mr. Ross, you know, wanting to come up with language and I get that the, the problem with, you know, listing, you know, what they cannot stop us from, we might forget something and then they'll say, aha, mm -hmm. but if we do it the other way around, then I'm okay with that. I'll be all right with that. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, I don't think we should try to come up with language. I think we state the principle and then LEAP has provided for us a model act produced by lawyers from a center focused on equity uh, at the national level uh, that goes into, goes into great detail. Uh, and I don't think we should be trying to come up with the language either positive or negative when, with, when there are people who this is their specialty, equity is what they're all about, and LEAP recommends them, I think we ought to use their language. And if we, if there's, I, I yeah, I'll just stop there. Did I miss something? Was it in their report? Because I, I read the report. Uh, it was linked in their report. Oh, I didn't, I haven't read the links. Okay, okay. I have, I have now, it's, but I, in the, in our, the draft of our report, I cop, I, I copied it out and pasted it in the appendix. Okay. I'll, I'll take a look. Okay. You know, anything that ordinary people going about their business, driving, getting pulled over, you know, your 10, you know, miles more, faster, whatever, anything that will relieve bike up folks driving will be very, very helpful, I think. Oh, all this stuff? Well, let's see, I'm not sure what you're seeing now. Oh, um, data Just collection, can you go up? Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, down, down. I saw the list. Go down, I apologize. Uh, keep, um, is it this one? Oh, uh, there, there are a whole bunch of lists here. Yeah, okay. I, I, I don't think it makes sense for us to try to analyze yeah. the language together tonight. We, yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll take a look, yeah. One thing that I did not do after I've, finished putting this together today, I went for a walk and I got to thinking about, you know, there's so much stuff in our report. I think at the end of the report, we should add a summary of recommendations. That kind of becomes a checklist of all the things we want them to implement. Um, and I think, you know, that it'll make it easier for, for town council, town manager, but also for community activists to keep the pressure on about each of those things. Or do we want to do what uh, Deborah suggested to do an executive summary? Well, we have a we have a table of contents that mm -hmm. sort of talks about the issues to be covered. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, again, some of these things I think we want to give the reason, um, so we don't get people closing their minds before they understand why. I also, um, Russ, I read this version, uh, I think today, and I thought it was really good. I do think that we should add before the conclusion a page on the stuff that we said we were going to get to in the last report, but couldn't because we weren't given the time and resources to do. For example, okay. so add. I can, I can add that and send it to you. Great. Um, so this is most can most of those things be referred to the resident oversight board now? Um, let me pull it up. Let's see. So yeah, so I haven't seen 
this version, you know, while you're looking Me at either. it. Yeah. yeah, I haven't looked at, at this version. So obviously, you know, we need to kind of look through it. In terms of a summary of, of the recommendations, yeah, again, I think that that's a good thing, but we do need to think about it, whether we want to do it in the beginning or we want to do it in the end. I hear you, Russ, it's almost kind of like what Leap was saying in terms of their report. Well, we don't want to kind of put it out there because then the police will get upset and then, you know, they won't, you know, I get that though, but also, you know, who are we writing this to, too? If this is a 40 page, you know, document, you know what I'm saying? It's like, if we bury everything at the end, then people might not get to that. Maybe if they do see those recommendations right off the bat and they get upset, guess what? They'll read it because they're gonna be like, oh wait a minute what they put this over here uh why you know as opposed to you know kind of like just ramble on ramble on ramble on for 40 pages and then at the end here we go here we go with the recommendations you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. um i just worry about that i i know there's this thing of like not pissing people off but it, it's it, for me it's not about not pissing people off it's about we, I want the town council to vote most of this. And I want to open their minds to the need before they get to, oh, here's what I really have to do. I don't want them to go, oh, I don't think that. Because then their mind is closed when they read the reasons. But I, but the, it's this is not wait till the end for the recommendations. This is right, you know, recommendation, you know, description recommendations. They're sprinkled. All, they're, they're summarized at the yeah. beginning. I mean, there's a list of the areas at the beginning. There, the details are in the report, and then at the end, it there's a there'll be a a checklist to, so that everybody can say, did you do this? Did you do that? That. Uh, Miss Pat. So I think we need to be consistent. If we're asking LEAP to do executive summary, I think we need to be consistent with, with the entire report. I think for people, people don't read anymore. You know, people just want to get the headline. You know, this group has been meeting for almost a year. So what is their second part in, uh, recommendation? Boom, 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 in, in executive summary. Well, Who maybe. To read maybe. The whole thing or not? I do not care if Town Council or APD, you know, will get um, upset, you know, of what we're recommending at the beginning as executive. We're writing this for the marginalized people, for BIPOC folks, who are also very anxious and waiting to read our report as well. So if we're going to do it, we have to be consistent. If we decide to do it at the end, then we need to let LEAP know for them to do it at the end. No, I, yeah, I, I don't agree. I think Leap's report can have a very different format than ours. But it sounds to me like what you're talking about is we need a press release sort of for the BIPOC community. We need like a two or three page summary of the whole thing, or maybe, or maybe a one page summary, you know, what, whatever length you think people will read. I think this Actually, report no, is written, not, this report is written for the no. town. What's that? Sorry, finish up. I'm sorry. I, I, mean, I, I think this report is written for the town council and the town manager. It's written for the people who have the power to implement the policies. I don't say it that way. I see it. The reason why we got together is because of racism, of police brutality, whether it's psychological, emotional, physical. That's why CSWG existed. And I can't speak for everybody. I'm hoping that our report is, will actually be speaking to the people who are most impacted more than anything else. Is the way I say it. Yeah, and, for, and for me, I mean, I, I do have to say that too. I mean, that's why I said that to leap. Um, and and that's what I think too, you know, it would be important to kind of make sure that even though, yeah, we want town council and town manager to ultimately put these things, vote these things into, into existence, but we want to make sure that we're communicating to the BIPOC community, you know, which at the end of the day, 
you know, who's going to have the time to read a 40 page report, even though, of course, that information is there. And the ones that want to sit down and read the 40 pages, hey, it's there, you know, but the ones that just want the, the quick, you know, summary, hey, I have 15 minutes and that's all I have because I need to go to my next shift, right, and to, to go to work. They have that 15 minutes and they feel like, okay, now I can I can take part in whatever discussion because I have that 15 minute summary. Um, and it didn't get lost in in something else. Um, so, and and I think we could use that for a press release. I think it would be important to do a press release though too, Russ. I think it would be important to do that. Put it out there, but also include it in our report. Now, let me put it in a different way. Assuming that I'm not part of CSWG, and that's why I'm reading all this in details to make sure that, you know, I feel comfortable with what we're putting out. Assuming that I'm not part of CSWG and, you know, my life is impacted by police action and a group come up with this type of report. I don't want to read everything because first of all, I don't trust MS police. So what I want to read is, what is it that this group has come up with? I want to say it like boom, 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 boom. When I have time, maybe I can come back and read it. That's the reaction you're going to get you know, from people. So I think it's very critical that we have that executive uh, summary of what we're proposing. And it's the, it's the responsibility of the town council to do their de uh, due diligence and read the entire report if they're going to make informed decision to vote on whatever recommendation that we make. I feel that we should be focusing more on the most impacted people. This is what this document is for. And I don't wanna be part of something that in the future, somebody will say, oh, your grandmother, great grandmother participated in this. And this is the way it came out. I don't wanna be part of that. Uh, we're not writing this for town council, I'm sorry. Because they, you know, most of them did, you know, what I'm what I'm going through is not what they go through. Uh, Miss Pat, thank you so much for saying that. I think what you said about people having time to read it really resonated with me because I, just speaking for myself, I only got involved with town politics when I had the time. And I think a lot of people have engaged with us through forums or surveys. I think it would be kind of nice to have um, just a cover page with an executive summary with the recommendations that we have numbered out. And maybe that can also be a way to encourage community members to join us for our presentation. Yeah. Okay, I'll work on an executive summary. Thank you. I know it's my work for you. Thank you. Thank you. So what are we saying about traffic control again? We're taking out the one we recommended, the subcommittee, right? I think we should take it out because- Oh, there's no subcommittee recommended. That That's out. Okay, we good, that, okay. We made that decision last time. Okay. What's still in, Let's see, where are we here? Uh, we're still in the appendix here. What is currently in is this section. Oh, okay. I'll read it later. I think I read it. Yeah. Well, you wrote most of it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, which goes through some of the data about, yeah. you know, yeah. review some of the data out of our Part A report. Actually, it's, it's Brianna. She did some of this writing. Chart in. Um, Seven Jen. You know, it says. Places like Berkeley and Brooklyn Center have voted to move traffic control. Even New York has done some, been recommended for some. We find this recommendation fits our community best and it's critical to move on to ensure the safety of BIPOC community members. And then here are the bullet point recommendations. Got it. So, are, so we're, are we keeping this, even though it's not going to get implemented? 
I think we should still keep it. Okay. Yeah, me too. Okay. But for me, I, I guess I just need like, what what's gonna be? Saturday, everyone get, get gets feedback. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, because it's saying it, my internet. Oh, we we'll just lost you again for a minute. Yeah. So why don't you, yeah. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead? Then I'll. I'll... Stop. Going. Try again, Deborah. I said, I'll come back and talk to you all after. Okay. 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 So are we, are we waiting for Deb? I'm looking right now at um, just pages 15 through 29. So the traffic control was like three, four, three pages. And then it, it looks like from, let me just. From 15 on is really just incorporating leaps recommendations, which I'm okay with. Yep. Leap said these things so well, I decided there was no reason to try to rewrite it and say it differently. Okay. I, I thought them um, including the examples of different places was really good too. Yeah. I mean, I kept in the place where we had what we had written about some of the reasons why it's so important to reduce stops uh, and what other places had done. That That is ours. But the rest of it is... Uh, the stuff that's in the different typefaces all from Leap. And now, of course, they may change some of it and we'll have to <laughs> cut and paste it all over again, but that'll be fine. I would, I would like to suggest that we move on and, you know, we because I haven't read this, we can all give feedback by Saturday noon. Send it to Ms. Moiston. Uh, why don't you just send it right to me? So as as can we do that? Everybody can write to me as long as I don't write back to everybody. Okay. And, and then I can, and Brianna and okay, and I can share. I have a quick question before we move on to the next item. In regards to this rough draft, is everybody okay with adding in a section in regards to our last report on page 20? We had a list of stuff that we did not address. Is it okay to write a section on us not being able to address it because of time and resources? Resources. Okay. Because yeah. of, yeah, resources. Okay. Because yeah. I'm looking at it right now and we did a lot of it, but it's yeah. just, I'm looking at, for example, the scale of police response, police overtime and workload, um, racial diversity in the APD and hiring practices, mm -hmm. stuff like that were not addressed. Yeah. yeah the so, first yeah, year, the resources and the fact that they didn't, you know, because of the lack of resources, we weren't able to get all of it done, you know, so it, it does play into the time aspect too. Yeah, to hire consultant. Yes, exactly. It's not, yeah, it's not because of our time. It's because we need, we needed help. Exactly. We get all the help I, we needed. Yeah, I'm in complete agreement. I don't know if we should, but I think it might be a good idea to keep in the appendix is the, um, the different drafts of our IFB because we started asking for it and we slowly had there to shake it down. Yeah, I think it should, I, I, I know I, it's not petty, but I think that it should be documented because we yes. asked for the resources to finish the job the right way. Yeah. And I, I think people reading this later. Yeah, I yeah. think- And we need to amplify it when you guys do presentation uh, to the town council. Yeah. Thank you for raising that, Brianna. Um, and so my question beforehand, can you all hear me now? Yes. Yes. It's just in terms of like um, the deadlines for everything. So just to go over it. So Saturday at noon, um, 
so should I also provide a uh, feedback to you, uh, Russ? Like yes, so should Brianna and I. So everyone yes. should do it, right? Yeah, by let's Saturday have everyone, at yeah. noon. And then you kind of look at the edits. And then will you wait for the leap information on Monday before you kind of send it back out to Brianna and I, I'm thinking, or how is that going? That's what I, well, I just want some clarity around that. I, I will just have to see how my time goes. I will try to deal with folk stuff from our group first, because mm -hmm. I don't think the leap input will then will change that. Um, I mean, leap input will change the report, but I don't think it'll change. I don't think it'll mess with things that we say. I mean, if there are things that I think Leap is going to comment on, I may leave them till later. But as soon as I get something done about putting it together, I'll send it to you and Brianna. Okay. But I, I can't, you know, I have other obligations. I can't promise exactly when it's going to get done. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that's Thank what I want to So, is, um, so is this in um, what document? Ms. Marston? You're muted, Jennifer. Russ sent it to me, I thought, as the Word document. OK. So we can just make Yeah, but it's, but it's, hold on. But, but people, you, when you sent it to people, did you send it as a Word doc? You sent it in the packet. It's a PDF, right? I sent it in the packet as a PDF, but I can send it to the end. I think I, I thought I forwarded it just your email to them, but maybe I didn't. I but I can send it to the group as a Word doc. That that would be very yeah, helpful. Yeah, I'd that rather have it as a Word doc. Yeah, send it to everybody as a Word doc for sure. Okay. Thank you. OK. And then the one, last, one last quick thing for clarity. Do we want to send out a press release to the community in regards to our recommendations in the presentation? And yes. if so, would the group be okay? I can work on the draft for that and I can share with the group. Would the group be able to edit that or would we be breaking open meeting law? Oh, I was I think the subcommittee should do it. Oh, not okay. To break, yeah, not to break uh, open meeting law. Just to remind you, we are not officially a subcommittee. We are the group. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we are the Us? group writing the, yes, the individuals sorry. writing the report. <laughs> That's right. But I thought, yeah, but I thought that that's why, like, if if Brianna doesn't edit or she puts something together, can't she just get it out to, or she can send it to Jennifer, Jennifer can get it out to us, and then we could just get the edits back to Jennifer. Yes, yeah, so everybody could write back to Jennifer, and then yeah. Jennifer could send it to the three of us, even. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, for our report, but I'm saying even for Brianna's, like, pr press release, too, yeah. we could do things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. And what day are you going to do that? Just so I can look out, like if it's on a weekend, sometimes I don't, I don't look at my email as much as I do during the week. So as well, you should not, you should not, you should not, you, you have a life uh, beside uh, working. Turn off I your know. Gmail notifications. <laughs> I just, I don't, I, yeah, like, I don't want to, you guys send it and then I've not do anything with it because it's the weekend and I know that yeah. we're under time constraints. So if you can just tell me an idea of when you'll be sending it so I can look at it like anticipate it, that would be better for me. Okay, I could get that done by, what's today, Thursday, by Monday. And if people could send in their recommendation, their, not recommendations, their revision by Tuesday, and we could have it in, we could send it to the Gazette and to the Indy on Wednesday. I think that's too early. Let's, let's, there's no reason to, to rush it. But if we if we get it to them on Friday, even. Um, okay. I think we should get the press release out before the town council presentation. Yeah, that's what I think too. The press release yeah, I think get we should, out earlier. Yeah. We need to hype this up, really amplify this, really, really good, so that we you know people can turn out to to watch. Um, CSWG presentation. Yeah, I think part of the press release is to get people to turn out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for the press release, yeah, I think no, we should. The newspaper doesn't it. need it before Thursday night. The what? I don't think the newspaper needs it before Thursday night, though. They're not going to do anything 
they're not likely to do anything with a press release about a Monday meeting. If we if we get it out on Wednesday, perhaps. All right. Well, I guess I guess with Jennifer, maybe you can provide some of that information because I think what we what we're looking for is like a, a press release blast, right? It needs to be the, yes. the and or whatever else, but we need to have it on the website because whatever press release we're also going to be talking about the the actual uh, council meeting, and we want people to come out for that so we can have support, just like we had yes. on a. Yeah. So yeah. whatever's the the news blast, right, to all the different places and and things like that, sharing it. Obviously, the the final press release we needs to be shared with us so we can get it out to our social media and our networks and things like that we just need to do a blast so that everyone can show up for the 25th yeah. so we have a press release blast that mm -hmm. includes and so you can send it to me and then we can send it out that way and then i can specifically make sure it gets to scott i just know like if you send it in like the deadline is yeah, so it just depends on when you want it to, to be seen in the paper, but I think it should also be, you know, the ABC News and, and NBC, you know, Channel 22 News should have access yeah. to it. Yeah, they haven't you, covered yeah. anything that we've done. So, so by when, by when, Jennifer, do you think in terms of deadlines, we should get uh, well, it? Well, when do you that? want the blast to be done? Like, do you want the blast to be done on for Thursday? Do you want the blast to be done for Friday? I'd watch out for the weekend because... It's the weekend, but I would say Thursday because Friday people are not paying attention. Yeah. Thursday, yeah. So then I would have it to me by Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, it would be good if it went out Thursday, like the blast went out everywhere so it could be in everyone's minds. Yeah. So Brianna, you'll have the press release ready for Sunday I'll yeah I'll work on it for Sunday and then revisions will come Monday and then finalize for Tuesday yeah uh yeah we should be okay for because if if you even if you do it after two o'clock, like usually I think there's like a one thirty deadline for the day before. So if I have it for Wednesday to give to them, they should be fine. Okay, that sounds good. And if that doesn't work, then I will uh, reach out to you guys and let you know that we need to change that. Perfect. Um, are we ready to move on to the next agenda item? Yes. All right. So the next thing that we have on the agenda is the CREST implementation meeting follow-up. So since we last reported to you guys about CREST, um, the position was rated at a level six. I'm just going to screen share so that you guys can see the salary ranges really quickly. Um, Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. So um, the last time we had a CREST implementation follow-up, we were the CREST director was rated at a level six. I believe right now it's rated at a level seven because um, Russ, myself, and Alicia went back and made some revision on, revisions on the job description to really embody the full role of supervision and leadership that this person taking this position will have. Um, I think we advocated for a level eight though. And um, this week we went over the preliminary data that you guys had in the packet. Um, and we talked about the shifts and what LEAP is suggesting off, based off of their preliminary data. And if it's not, if the program is not 24 seven for the program to have somebody to be on call to talk to people and answer people during the night between three and 7 a.m. As LEAP suggested that there won't be many calls. Um, Jen and Russ, did I ha miss anything? Uh, did we decide about uh, working uh, four days on and two days off? Yes. Yes. 
we decided that was the the most workable schedule, I think. Um, I have a comment. Oh, okay. Ahead. I have a comment. Thank you guys for pushing from level six to, to level seven. I can tell you right now, it will be very hard to hire a crest director at that salary. It will be very, very difficult. With the, with the amount of responsibility. In my experience in negotiation, we need to put in what we would like to see, CSWG. So if the town manager decide to change the amount, I don't want us setting for look so that the history will show that this group, this is what they recommended. If you guys thought about A, level A, and I say pushback, we need to leave it at level A. And let's watch, you know, what town council and town manager are going to say publicly that level A is not appropriate. So I'm pushing for comparable. This is what equity is all about. We we're hoping that we will hire a BIPOC candidate or somebody who is marginalized candidate. And then to come on nickel and dime, you're not going to get, you know, quality candidates for that salary. I can tell you right now, you're not going to get that. Miss Pat, I, I completely hear you. And I think yeah. that the thing that was the hardest to negotiate is just that we're working within a system that hasn't dealt with a program like this. And we talked about why it's so important that this person, this person's pay be comparable to the chief of police or the chief of fire, but it, I don't know, it's very difficult to negotiate that. And I wish the meetings were recorded so everybody could be a part of it. Cause there, I do feel like there is a lot of negotiation so in what systems I'm, that we okay. have to work within. Okay, let me restate, restate this. This is what the implementation team is recommending. However, when we brought it to CSWG, this is what we would like to see for the salary to be comparable to what the departmental heads on in this town. I mean, this is what social justice is all about. We can put out that. Ultimately, I, that I know so the good. town manager will go for the, whatever the implementation team recommended, but the story need to be told to the community, like this is what we agreed upon in CSWG. I just, I think that that's a good idea. Um, and the only thing I want to say about that you show, but so first of all, I just want to back up and say the implementation team's not recommend, recommending the seven. That is what we're told after it goes through its process that it is rated at. So we've, the implementation team, at least the two co-chairs and Russ have already said that they feel like this should be at the the rate of the police chief. So it's not the implementation team recommending this. That's that this is what the HR director and the town manager came up with through the rating system. The other piece is, I do suggest that you say, we think it should be compared somewhere in the report or somewhere, I don't know where you're gonna put it, but comparable to the PD, the chief of police. But the only thing I'm gonna say about that is the chief of police has over 40 years of service, which changes it drastically. Right, so you need to find out whatever that base level for him would be, right, or mid level or whatever. But he's working under forty years of service. Uh, thank you, Ms. Moist and Ms. Ferreira. I mean, I think that's the thing. It's just like asking what, why is it not hitting that that level eight, uh, level eight grade, right? So because usually it, it depends on you know supervisory level, how many people they're supervising a certain level of like expertise that that level eight is having that it's not. I mean, I get what you're saying, um, Ms. Moisten, that, you know, obviously the chief has this number of years. However, you know, what is it that would get this person to that level? I'm assuming you all have had this conversation. So is there an answer to that as to why it's being leveled at seven as opposed to an eight? What's missing? in that director position that keeps leveling it at this lower level. Do I mean, so that? I would take a look at what is listed at a level eight currently, 
the different positions. So brief, you want to put this the chart back up. And I'm not making any stake. I'm just to make that very clear. Um, I'm just sa saying if you. So this is where it was originally rated. That's was where it was six. originally with the other because it's community safety, not public. I don't know how to explain how they determined it, that it would equal to like where the senior center director is and the town clerk and then you have yeah, but but all the other ones the ones that level eight now that you're reading like we're mm -hmm. reading is like health and community service director human resources director director of conservation development so crest director why wouldn't it fall into that whereas the other one is assistant it director assessor assistant exactly. superintendent the building commissioner the comptroller and the health director and the lsc director of recreation and the planning director. So the only thing I can really, only one of these positions that I can really speak on more is so each of these positions, except for maybe the HR one is overseas in other departments, like multiple departments. So the health and community service director, which we don't have that position for is supposedly oversees all the people that are in health and public safety from the level six and seven and above right so it they would oversee the senior center the veteran service the um health department and amherst recreation department i don't know about the hr director why that's the director of conservation and development is also in charge of the inspections department the what's down there planning department which includes the zoning department and planning, zoning, and hold on, let me just look. Conservation, planning, and inspections. So those people that are on the eight oversee multiple departments. And that's the only thing that I can really, that was that I was told that makes the difference. And I don't know about the library director in there either, so except for there's multiple sites. I'm sorry, but if, if, if um, this position pays less, less than 90K, you're not going to get quality because it's a lot. You're talking, you're talking about dealing with behavioral issues, you know, clinical notes, so many stuff that needs to be done. If it's less than 90K, forget it. You're not going to get quality. You're not going to attract. Oh, uh, people, we could oh, hire them as out. a 90. It's a lot of work. People I mean, will burn out we could hire them as a 90 i don't like at 90 or at 87 i don't know like we we can hire them anywhere and i honestly to god think that the bigger concern is that the social worker is at a level two as opposed to the director being at 11 level seven but that's so just the, thing, the, the reason why we're talking about it and and kind of putting pressure about it jennifer is because in terms of, and this is why what I hear, obviously, right? This is what I've done for many years in terms of, uh, of diversity and trying to be more inclusive, right? Is that to get someone, you know, quality that's BIPOC to come here to Western Mass, because I hear this all the time, Deborah, we can't, we can't get them because they don't want to come to Western Mass because one, you're coming to a place that is majority white. Most BIPOC folks don't want to come to a place that's majority white, right? So one of the biggest carrots to get someone to move from the eastern portion of Massachusetts or from any, any other place in the country that has like down south or what have you that has more diversity or California, right? It has more diversity is one is, is, is the money because people are not going to be attracted. And then two, obviously perks and benefits. Three is going to be saying that there's a community of color out here, right? And that there's some support, there's this, there's that. But the first carrot always is going to be money. You know? Right, and I don't, don't I mean, money, I- We're not going to attract, if we're trying to make sure that we have a diverse pool of candidates with money. the adequate experience, the first uh, attraction to get them out here is going to be money. So I understand that, but then my guess would be that you guys need to have them be supervising or responsible for more than one department, because that's what is happening with all of these other positions. Mm -hmm. And so what, that's- what, 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 what do you mean? Uh, AP, APD chief supervises APD. Um, okay, but, I'm um, at, so, but we're, I'm at level eight, because that's what we were just talking about, level eight, yeah. right? Yep. And again, I don't have any stake in this, so I fully understand where you're coming from. I'm just explaining it to you, right? All of the positions in level eight, 
except for maybe the HR director, which I don't quite 100% understand, has, but it must be because of, you know, usually they're, I, I don't really know, but, but the health and community service director, the director of conservation, the building commissioner, and the library director all oversee more than one department, right? What different departments would like the library director oversee? So my guess is the library is such a big, they have the three branches. And then inside of those three branches, each of those branches have separate departments. But for the crest director, they're going to be overseeing the responder, doing the clinical care keeping and doing the ongoing training, which feels like three separate things. Yeah. Those are three yeah. separate yeah. things. Three sep it's a uh, lot. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, then yeah. you guys rewrite the and then send it back to me and then I'll send it back to them because well, I don't you're... like I'm just trying anything to explain where it's coming from. You're not, anything less than 90K, you're not going to attract quality BIPOC candidates. It's not going to happen. But Ms. Pat and Deborah, you are preaching to the choir right now. We are all in agreement. I mean, we I think I've advocated for this advocated in for this more. way for a very long time. So I'm, and I'm not the rule maker. And yeah. I don't, I feel like I get stuck in this place all the time where I'm not making the rules. I'm trying to explain to where this perspective is coming from and how that works, right? No, They're not my rules. And we're, so, we're appreciated. And I understand that you guys are frustrated. So I try to put that, put it aside, but my goodness, um, you guys, need to, so I understand that they have these three things to be responsible but having three things with inside of one department is still different than having four or five departments that have to report to you and so the difference there is that there's multiple things that are reporting to them and I fully agree but that's 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 what what it is okay yep yeah, and I mean, Jennifer, I mean, I hope you don't, uh, I hope you don't like misinterpret. It's not, nothing to do with you and we're appreciative. You're trying to explain it. You see what I'm saying? And I know it's frustrating for you, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've been on the team, on the implement, you know, part of the implement, implementation team and kind of going back and forth with everything. And we understand how the bureaucracy works. You know what I'm saying? So that part, it's not in terms of, for us, it's just more so understanding it more on our end and what, and I'm, and I'm thankful that you're, you're, you're giving us, you know, some of the differences, but it's, it's in, term, in terms of going back because we don't want this to fail, right? And what, what do I mean by that? So for me, when I say I don't want this to fail is that I don't want it to, to kind of go through the rigmarole, right? The whole the process. And then we get, again, the, the same old, same old candidates, right? That we're gonna end up with, which is a non-diverse pool that ends up then getting a candidate there that possibly is not going to do what we, we need this person to do, right? Because the, 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 the money's not there. It's not gonna attract the expertise. So I guess the bottom line is, because you all have been on there, I'm only listening to it you know, from the outside because I'm not on those team meetings. Is there anything that can be done for us to level up a little bit more to this level eight, or at least to start at, 90k you know and above is there anything else I'm, to be done i mean they can start at 90k it's not recommended so let me say that the, the overall the non-union wage scale moves two percent every year to begin with so like every uh fiscal year it is redone and it and it moves up two percent right and then it, within that time you get a step an annual step increase on your anniversary and then you get a cola so the, the wage scale moves and then like every, I don't, I don't know, five, 10 years, they redo the entire thing to, to match more of the cost of living. So you can hire them at a, at a nine. We, we try not to hire people over a step five typically, but at a step five, that's got them at 84. So the step eight is 92 at, out of 11 steps. So, I mean, there's no reason why they can't come in at oh wait i was reading the wrong one so yeah, it would no. have to be that is the right one. Oh, sorry so what well, is wait a minute what are you um wait wait can yeah. you go up a little bit please um brianna this is fy21 this is old this is the wrong scale yeah, I will. I, I can go on the web right now and pick up the scale and we can look at it that way if you just give me a second. Well, but the, the question Deborah asked is what can now be done? 
Right. And just so, so you know, we we actually met with a we insisted that HR meet with us and we got them to share with us as much as they would of the rubric that they use so we could look at all the criteria that they considered when rating a position. And then we went back again to the job description and tried to write in everything we could that looked like it might, you know, trigger any of those points in their in their rubric to try to get it up to an eight. Uh, and that got it from a, a six to a seven. Uh, at this point, I think all that's left to do is to advocate with the town manager, either that he push it to an eight. I mean, HR can't, they've got to go by their system, but he could push it to an eight or that he, you know, come to grips right now with the fact that it's going to be important to hire at a very high step on that scale. But I, I don't see what else can be done. And we've got to get this position posted. And, and I honestly wouldn't suggest may, having any other departments have to report to them as a new program. So no, the job, that job's too big already. Yeah. So 90,000 is a step four. Can you see this? Mm-hmm. And then there's a 92 step over here. There is no 90 on the seven. It's either 89 or 92. And you have 90 here at a step four. And it goes up to, it, you know, it's a $10,000 dif difference at the end. So, so to be honest, um, some of this pay scale doesn't mean anything to me because you look at finance director on super salary scale. It's not an accident that he came up to that. Are you saying if APD who has a chief who have 40 years of experience goes to apply for a job in another community, they will consider that? Are we just assuming that candidates who will be applying for the CREST program who don't have any experience? Somebody with PhD who wants to apply for a CREST program director in psychology that has psychology background, for example, you're going to offer that person 70K, good luck finding such candidates. I'm, we're I'm, just assuming I'm, that, you know, people well, who I mean, job will not have experience. If we're pushing for, you know, APD uh, chief have 40 years of experience, we don't know what other people, you know, work experience has been before they apply for the CREST program. So, I mean, we're not going to come into any final resolution tonight. My recommendation is when we do our report, we will say that CSWG is really recommending minimum of 90K. Forget about the, the level or whatever, 90K minimum to attract high quality BIPOC candidates. So that puts it in different terms. But what I was going to say is if you think about it, um, the largest amount of people have quit their jobs in the month of August, right? For unfair treatment and unfair pay. We just had 10,000 people who are on strike from John Deere. There's another five to 10,000 that are on strike from Kellogg Cereal, all because of pay and unfair treatment. So right now it is the employer's employees market. It's not exactly. the employer's market, it's the employee's market. So yeah. if you're gonna try and push without adding anything else to the job description, I would use that to push because we're not offering any sign-on bonuses like even McDonald's and Burger King have sign-on bonuses at this moment. Do we're we not, have? We don't have any relocation funds going out right now either. So if you're going to do something, I would suggest that you use the way that the market is running now to try to have it switch to the eight. That's the only thing I can think of because you just can't put anything else on their plate that's not already on that job description. Mm -hmm. Or you okay. just say they have to come in at 90,000, which still... I mean, honestly, and you don't even want to do that because they could put them at the top of the six. So we don't want that. Level, right. I'm actually pushing for level nine, actually, so that they start from, you know. But I don't see APD chief. Where, where does it fall in here? Because the chief is, both the chiefs are contracted. Oh, okay. I got you. The chiefs, the town manager, all have contracts. Okay. Okay. This was helpful. I'm surprised that we don't have relocation fees. That was my question. I don't, municipalities don't typically because, it, you know, it's, it's not 
I mean, it's probably not best practice, but I think at this moment, municipalities are trying to, are rethinking that because all municipalities are having a hard time uh, hiring, right? There's a hiring issue for specific jobs. Yeah. We advertised for uh, Anthony's job and there weren't many applicants with that skill set or who even wanted to do it. And then we advertised for the assessor and it was the same thing. Like there's just those jobs that have those specific requirements are hard to fill right now. Uh, Ms. Ferreira. So, you know, just looking at the time, we're at 8.13. I know we had said we we're going to be until 8. I mean, I can't stay on much longer. Obviously, you all can continue forward. I'm going to have to sign off by, by 8.30. Okay. Um, so I guess my my thing is in terms of the, um, with the implementation and questions, because I guess, like, Ms. Pat, you you probably had more information than I had, you know, in terms of obviously being in the, in the know in terms of what's going on in the implementation te uh, team meetings. Because I didn't know about this this piece about um, that there's not going to be a separate kind of number, and also that it's not going to be you know you know. No, there is going to be a number. Oh, there is going to be a different number. Is incorrect. Nobody said there wasn't going to be an. Oh, but I thought there was. I thought Miss Pat, you said something about the communication was that they still had to call into nine one one. That's yeah. There, there'll be three ways to call in. Oh, but okay. not directly. But not directly. I'm, not, I'm actually okay, can, not can, I guess, can you all explain this to me? Because I guess I'm confused. No, okay. We, <laughs> have, not final, no. we have not made the dispatch decision. So nobody should be announcing that it's one way or the other. Crest recommended three ways to call in, including a direct way. Mm -hmm. But we have not addressed this because we haven't had the dispatch person with us to do it. Oh, so, okay. So that hasn't been decided. No. Oh. Okay, good. I, and then what I about the 24-7? Uh, what is going on with that? The, the 24 seven part. Is there any updates on that? Can I correct something? Um, I'm not actually part of the implementation team. I only attended once because Brianna you know, was not available, but I'm not part of the press implementation program. About no, I get that, but I'm saying, what about the the fact that it's not going to be 24/7? I, I guess that so so Leap sent in the information, and what what are they saying? Um, so the preliminary data that they sent in, in short, Do you want, can we, you share or yeah. no? Um, I can yeah. share because it's in the packet, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's just that obviously the packet was super long, and I know I missed the whole the stuff. the packet is is super long. Um, because yeah. every report is like 10, 20 pages, which is, <laughs> is definitely something to consider when you're making a report that you want people who this is not their forte to read. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why that's why we were talking about the executive summary. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would take a stab on this. I think perhaps the reason why implementation team is thinking of Part time instead of 24 7 is the fact that town council only approved eight responders. So they're trying to make it work. Or maybe that's mm. why Leap, you know, um, recommended that could be wrong. Uh, you but, guys correct me. I think Leap looked at the calls from 2019 and based off the calls in 2019, they did find that 35% of citizen initiated calls would go to Crest. And I think it was like 17% that were um, from the CAD. But I think that they recommended the um, two eight hour shifts or two 10 hour shifts just because from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. there was um, a very small percentage of calls that would fall under Crest just from the data. That's what they made the preliminary things off of. As I recall, the data showed that during those hours there would only be one call every three days. So the thought was if right. you have somebody who's on call that can respond starting but they they call the crest number you know what is missing though is that it the chunk of some of the residents may not be calling the police may not feel comfortable calling the police so <clears throat> the data is very unreliable i think but, yeah, i mean know, i think I think the thing would be, right, that if the data is showcasing this, which is 2019 pre-pandemic, right, which obviously makes sense, right, because pre-pandemic, it kind of is more uh, evaluative of what was transpiring and what a normal kind of day might look like at night. So my thing would be, okay, if, if we were going to go by this type of data, 
it, 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 like like Ms. Pat said, you know, once we do have the responders there, hopefully the thing is going to be that people are going to feel more comfortable, especially if yeah. there's different ways for them to call in, yeah. that they're going to feel more comfortable and they, they, then they are going to call more so to the police, right? To Not to the police, to the responders, to get them to come out. So then what's going to happen? Is there going to be a process to say, okay, this is happening, now we need to, to, to have more responders on, or is it gonna be, let's send this to the police? Because if we send it to the police and respond, then it's gonna be what Ms. Pat is saying, then, then the responders is gonna be like, you know, sabotage towards them. You but know? don't because you think that's like at risk regardless, if, even if we have four responders on per shift and there's three calls, then that would, third call has to go to the PD? Just saying on a on a regular basis. I mean, just on a specific night. Like even if we had four responders per shift, right? Two teams mm -hmm. of two per shift, right? One group is out on one call, the other one's on another call, and then another call comes in. That's why you have the supervisor. That that has been eliminated. We 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 recommend the program mm -hmm. director and then press um Re, uh, responder supervisors or something like that and that is even not been included anymore what another thing i well, wanted to say miss pat how did you decide that hasn't been included from what i read from leap uh program yeah but that they're they're recommending stuff to us we're not i mean we the implementation team doesn't have to necessarily just because they recommend it do write it in that manner what the implementation team agreed to today was there has to be an understanding that if the work sort of rolls outside eight hour shifts those we will pay those those workers overtime and that many of the calls that come in well, we don't know the numbers, but some of the calls that come in, somebody really needs somebody to talk to, but they don't have to have somebody show up right away. Now, sometimes they do. Uh, but my conviction is that with ARPA funds, you know, being spent over a three-year period, if we find that there are, you know, we start getting a lot of calls that the data is shifts dramatically, I, I think we've got a strong case to add responders, but I think we weaken our case if we hire a lot of responders for a time which currently doesn't show, show calls. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think we get, we get this program up and running and you know, we, have, we have both a director and an assistant director uh, or some sort of other leadership position, we're still battling over what it's going to be called and what its responsibilities are. That person can help out, and um, I think we I think we'll have enough people that we can handle a reasonable number of calls. And if we start getting a lot more, then we've got to go back for more money. I don't, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, Ms. Ferreira, and then Ms. Pat. Yeah, and I think in terms of responding to you, Jennifer, I mean, you know, for us, we always wanted this to be um, a 24 seven program, right? To have it there 24 uh, seven and to have it be fully staffed. Obviously for us, we were saying four responders for each shift because we were like, okay, whatever's going to be able to be passable, given the fact that the town is always saying, we don't have money, we don't have money, we don't have money. You know what I'm saying? So you're right, maybe four isn't enough, you know? But at this point, what we have, what we're going to, what we've, we, we've had to submit to, right, is, is to leap analyzing the information, looking at, at the percentage of calls and then going from there. You know, and for me, you know, at this point, I, I do agree with Russ in terms of like, that's been the resistance throughout this whole time. I mean, we can state it and keep stating that this is what we recommend, this is what we'd like. However, because the town and, and the powers that be, town Matt, whomever, hasn't wanted, you know, because of whatever reason to, to, to give us more, then this is what we need to work with. You see what I'm saying? So there, there's what we want, 
but then there's what we're given and what we have to work with, right? And then there has to be that room for, and we have to describe it, the fact that if, if things change, we need to be nimble enough to then hire more people, to be able to, to add more, hopefully as the program gains more trust from the community. Yeah, and this is quite helpful because I think we, as you say, we need to both have a plan and to articulate that we need to be nimble enough to change. And I think the implementation team needs to emphasize that even more than we have. So it's really good to, to get that input from you all. Okay, so I want to add to what everybody have said. So the whole idea of 24 seven when you're dealing with human beings, you never know. Even if in the past from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. it's been very quiet, but if people know that they have other alternatives to call instead of 911, who knows? So fire department is 24 seven. Are they always busy overnight? No. But the town never made a decision based on that. Like we won't staff fire department overnight because it's not always busy. MS police is not always busy at a certain time of the, uh, of the day, I'm sure, or even night. Do we not you know, staff 24 seven? Yes, and we should do that. Same criteria from CREST program. Anything less than 24, uh, 24 seven, I'm not convinced. We cannot put human life, safety, and you know, in terms of money, I get very irritated. I think our, our committee, CSWG, we should continue to push for 24 seven. The town manager and the council, council may not implement that, but I'm looking at the future when we are no longer on this planet and our you know, future generation will read this. Anything yeah. less than 24 seven, there's no, I'm not buying that. We need to put that in our report. Some council may not, you know, agree with us, but we need to be consistent, please. Fire department okay. is 24 seven, APD is 24 seven. They're not always busy, but I think it should be, you know, it's the a, it's a right thing to do to have fire department and APD 24 seven. It should be the same exact criteria for 24 seven. It should not change because uh, CREST program, you know, will benefit BIPOC and marginalized people. This is what equity is all about, people. Right, this but is I just what social justice is all about. I just want to say that nobody has said that we couldn't do twenty four seven. I mean, it's just the what. It's just what they've put in their data based off of the call log. I don't trust it. I mean. Yeah, I don't trust that. The, the data is not valid as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't buy it. I mean, if you feel like it needs to stay in line with the other public safety departments, then that's what you put for. I, I don't know yeah, that anybody has said yeah. that it can't be, but you know, when you look, I think that they were looking, they're looking at the data. Data that's can all. be manipulated. I don't, I don't trust it. I'm sorry. You know, it comes with history. I don't know, you know, people can put up whatever data they want in their own favor. So, I mean, I yeah. think sleep is pretty good. So I, I don't know that they're doing it to be on one side or the other, but it's just what the data showed. Uh, Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna reiterate. I think, I think we still, you know, Ms. Pat, I think we still say what it is that we, you know, want yeah. us to be. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I don't think yeah. we lose that. But then we've already been shown. I mean, the, the directive's gone out, right, from town council. Look at the data that LEAP is going to provide, you know, then we're going to do this and this, you know. So it has to be a one first thing is this is what we recommend, which is 24 7. Two is what the town council told us what to do. So this is what we have to do right now. But then three is, Listen, because we, you know, hopefully, right, this is going to, 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 to be something that's going to work and people are going to be able to have an alternative. So what are we going to do to be able to, to change very quickly so that we can add more responders, right? So once the, the, the position is set for the responders and recruitment is set for the responders, da, 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 once the data continues to grow, how can we add more responders 
and we have the money for that and hopefully diminish the need for more police, right? While we're adding more respondents, diminish the need for more police so that then we can add to the responder list. So I think those are the kind of the, the three things that I say. So it doesn't take away from what we recommend. I think what we recommend has to stay there. Okay. Okay, so we can continue to advocate for 24 seven. I'm glad that we were able to have this conversation and update you all. Um, are we okay to move to the next agenda item or did anybody have any more comments on this? I'm good. Okay. Uh, so the next agenda item is the resident oversight board follow-up. Jen, would you be able to pull up the notes from the packet? I can pull it up actually. <laughs> I know you just closed it. <laughs> Hang on. Because uh, I feel like this is just a lot and I don't want to say anything out of. Yeah, I, it's hard to find like in the packet itself because the packet yeah. is so big. Oh. Yeah. Here we go. Can you see? Yes. Oh, it says. Here we go. So the Mr. Vernon Jones took very detailed notes of the um, meeting that Alicia, myself, him, the chief and the town manager had in regards to the um, resident oversight board. Um, so it, he's, he divided each section on what we will do. Um, the things that we said that we would change in the, um, the proposal is I, I think very minor. I think the only thing that we're really adding is number two, which is adding language that the resident oversight board will invite representatives of, of police unions to at least one meeting of the board per year for the purpose of dialogue, building understanding and collaboration, moving forward solutions that would work for all. Um, does anybody have any issues with any of this or? And these notes were also shared with the town manager and the chief. So we're all on the same page about action steps to move this forward. Well, I mean, so can I have like a minute to just read it? <laughs> Cause it's the first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. It. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And I don't, can you scroll down a bit? Yep. Or is there stuff underneath that? It looks like it stops at, please no. Oh, it, can, can you guys see me scrolling right now? For some reason it says resume share. Oh. I, no, it's just stuck. No, we can't see the scroll. Okay, hang on. No, we can't. Sorry. It's okay. Well, I, I do have a couple <clears throat> of questions with the top part in terms of what changes we're making. Um, so th this one over here, the first one, remove the language about law enforcement personnel not serving on the resident oversight board. We trust, mm, we trust that a selection committee and the town manager will not appoint law enforcement personnel in the first couple of years of the board. I don't trust it. How, how would I trust it that that's not gonna happen? What does that mean? The town manager assured us he wouldn't do it and the police <laughs> assured us he wouldn't ask for it. Yeah, nah. No, I, I'm, I'm not good with that. You know, I'm sorry. Town manager, the town manager has showed over and over again that, you know. Well, the other issue is that he he's changes. He's all over the place. He's all over the place. So I, I, I'm not going to trust any of that. Yeah, but So I don't understand why they don't want that information there. I mean, we're very clear that we don't want law enforcement and law enforcement people on the, on the board. And especially since they might end up becoming the majority over the years, because remember, 10 years from now, we're not here. What's gonna to happen to this? You, you see what I'm saying? Um, and so for us, 
they may change it 10 years from now, but I want documentation right now that this is what we recommended, right? Because 10 years from now, when they do try to change it, then we have documentation that this is what we said. So if we already give, give up that, then it's like, you all never said it. Cause you know how quickly it is. I mean, they make up stuff willy nilly now, <laughs> you know, like rock and roll was created by, you know, white people. So, I mean, come on. Uh, so, w w I mean, that's that's something that we need to be careful on. I, I, I don't get that. And then um, the CSWG represent, number five, the CSWG represented clarified that the recommendation is that the board be consulted with regard to negotiations and new and revised policies, not that the board be present in negotiation sessions nor write new policy for the APD. The full authority of the chief and the town manager over negotiation policy is not reduced. So what do you mean nor write new policy for the APD? Um, I mean, I think, I don't know about writing, but they, they're going to be making recommendations for policies and pos policy yeah. changes and things like that. I agree that obviously it's gonna to have to be a collaborative effort and stuff, but them not writing new policy, I don't know what that means. And then we just heard from Tom that basically a lot of things get given up during those negotiations. That basically they do all their little, you know, okay, well, you know, you we'll give you this, which usually is like, we'll take away all the equity and inclusion stuff, you know, and then you don't, you know, take get the one percent or whatever, whatever. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of that going on in those negotiations. So I'm a little bit wary about giving a lot of that up too. We, so we right now those are the two ones that I'm seeing most, but I haven't paid attention to two, three, and four as much yet. Okay. But, uh, in, my, in my opinion, we gave up nothing with number five because we changed no language in our proposal. The police chief somehow got the idea that the resident oversight board was going to be able to just write policy and then the department would have to and deal with it regardless of, accept it regardless of whether it had any police input or not. And that was never our intention. It was always, you know, work together, consult, recommend, advocate. So we made no language changes. This just takes away some of his misimpressions. So this is not going to be included anywhere on the- No, 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 this document is not part of it. Okay. And what about well, the number so one though? Sense? Remove the language. What about number one? Remove the language about law enforcement, blah, blah, blah. We agreed to do that based on all of the things that the town, the police chief accepted that he didn't really like. I mean, this was a negotiation. You know, we we were not able to dictate to the chief everything, but we got him to agree to a whole lot of things he was not that happy with uh, in exchange for removing this language. I I think the resident, I think BIPOC folks will be very, you won't get a you know robust um, folks to apply for the committee if after a couple of years, then the town manager can appoint police officer. I agree. That, I is agree. That, is that yeah. my read on that? I, I think we need to let people know so that it's very transparent what we're what we're agreeing and what we're getting ourselves into. Based on 2004 racial profiling committee that was set up in this town, the mere presence of even one police officer changed the whole dynamic and effectiveness and productivity of a committee. If you are talking about police, it's not going to work. Yeah, I, ha I, I have a real problem. Hard work you guys put into it to negotiate this. You know, this is really raising red flag to me. Boom, 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 like flashing. People will not will not join the committee after after a couple of years. They won't do it. I yeah, and to me, and that will make it impossible for him to recruit a committee if he puts yeah. police on it. So he and we put a language that even though this is what the chief want, you know. We negotiated, but you know we need to write a, a sentence. We're concerned that BIPOC and marginalized people may not want to apply for this position for this uh, committee in the future if it's open to the you know police personnel. In regards, to, in regards to number one, like I, the police don't typically sit on any boards and committees, so I'm even. <laughs> flabbergasted that it's an issue yeah I, I, it's 
They, no, they're not going to want to. There's no way they're going to want to be on this. They're well, not. We, 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 but we, I understand uh, why you want the language that. in there. We, no, no, I understand no, no, no. why you want the language in there. But I'm still just they they don't. The town manager doesn't typically appoint any law enforcement into anything like into any border committee. But I understand why you want the language there just to in. It's been done before. In, in trust in it. It's right. been but done was before, that when the charge? But was that the charge, or did they say they weren't going to put any police on there? Well, I think Jennifer, I think this is based on uh, like our research and, and, and other municipalities and looking at other oversight boards. Um, you know, this is coming from that, at least for me, that's where this is coming from. And that's why it made a lot of sense for us to put that language is because you never know where at some mm -hmm. point, right? Maybe this town manager might not, but we don't know how long this well, town manager is going to be there, you know? So the next that's town the manager- That's the important piece there. Yeah, the, and then another town manager might think it's totally okay, you know, to come in and put a whole bunch of police officers on there. And we know that if we put, you know, police officers, they're going to, no one's going to be on the board. They're going to feel intimidated. They're going to feel like they're not able to speak freely, or they're going to get people, but they're going to get people that are going to be yes people to the police yeah. <laughs> that are going to go along with whatever the police say, you know? So, yeah, I guess we can have a board of yes people. Or, and or a board of people that are not going to speak, right? That are going to just be silent while the police make all the decisions. So either or, we're not going to have a board that's going to to be able to to, to be functional and efficient. And I'm also ah. just flabbergasted how the chief took offense to this. I don't even, I don't like, I don't know. And, yeah, thank you. And, and also the fact that it's happened before. 2004, it did not work. Resident and officers in a committee, they never worked. The power dynamic was very apparent. It's not going no, to work. No, I get that. When I interviewed for my position here, there was a, the, one of the captains were there at my interview. That It just yeah. doesn't feel okay, right? Like, it doesn't feel okay. So I understand that. I'm just, it's, and I understand why you want it in there. I was just saying, I'm just kind of like thrown away by the whole like typically they don't go on there and then I'm thrown away by the fact that the chief felt some kind of way about it. Like, why would it matter to him, honestly? Yeah, so I mean, so is there room to go back and I, I don't know, talk to him and let him know that obviously we, we're, we're very concerned about removing that language, um, you know, and, and, and unfortunately, I mean, we can put it a nice, nice way, which is, you know, we're happy that you chief and town manager would, would would uh, abide by this, wonderful. But the thing is, is that we're not doing this for you. We're doing this for the years to come, right? When maybe chief, you're not there, town manager, you're not there, right? We can't go by people. We gotta go by what the, the, the idea is in regards to this, right? And what's the effect we want it to have long-term, not just short-term, long-term. So we can do it in a very nice way. Thank you. We appreciate that you're on board, you're an ally, awesome. But what happens when you're not there anymore, when the two of you are not there anymore, and then the next chief ends up putting a whole bunch of police officers in there. <laughs> you can't sit and do anything, you know? So that's what we're trying to avoid. And that's why the language was important for us to have in there. I think at this point, it's not too late to go back if the group is in agreement of that, because these seem like action items. So we can go back and say that the CSWG wasn't willing to negotiate. I think one of the things that kind of pushed Alicia, myself and Russ to be okay with it is the fact that there's, I think the chief said that there was only like one or two retired police that um, live in town and that they, for the most part, or they aren't interested in groups and committees and stuff like that. And the town manager did say that he wouldn't um, appoint anyone to the board, but I do hear you guys' concerns and I understand them completely. So if we need to circle back, uh, Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, I don't know whether we can go back on this without having to give up something that we fought to keep. But I, we do have a section in which says that the resident oversight board can pass its own policies about itself. So the board could it put, you know, could just decide this after we've got a majority BIPOC board there. And the other thing is that we will. I mean, we, we have recommended that 
they implement this board right away, and then that we actually write a legal bylaw to institute it. Uh, and I think at that, we would have a better shot at that putting it in at that point than upsetting the negotiation that we had here. But that that's my view on it. But I mean, I, I guess it, it's like, so why do you feel that if we, you know, say that, no, we're gonna keep that, why do you feel it's going to upset the negotiations? Is that because, you know, again, I'm not, I wasn't in the meeting, so I don't know. And I'm, I'm assuming you, you all were under a lot of pressure to fight for the other ones. Is that the case? Is that what you're saying? And so you had to give up some things, but this is a big one to give up though. That, that's what I'm concerned with. And, and obviously two, three, four, five, we're, we're okay with because, you know, it is what it is, right? So we, we're really making some concessions. So why is it that you feel if we go back and we say, listen, you know, it's very important and this is why, which I think it makes sense why we, we want to change this, why this would just topple everything and we'd have to give something else up in order to, for them to get this one, for us to get this one. Can I, can I say, addition, in addition to what you just said, uh, Deborah? Maybe I'm getting something wrong. It's good that we collaborate with APD and the town manager, but that's not, we were charged to come up with recommendation. And there will be areas that we disagree with the uh, APD chief, and that's okay. We need to write this from the lens of the oppressed group. If we want super majority or majority of VIPO to, to serve on this committee, Putting this language will put people up. So we have to be transparent what we're giving up, please. People need to know what they're getting themselves into. I'm sure many people will not have time to, to, to read this. We didn't do this for the chief. Uh, we're doing this for the oppressed people. We should you know, present our document in that perspective. I'm sorry. Whether or not you know, the town council or the town manager will implement, implement it, that's a different story. But I want to work with my heads up and feel proud for the work being produced by CSWG. I'm not going, you know, we should not be catering to, we want to collaborate with APD. I get that, but this doesn't feel comfortable. I'm sorry. We need to take it out. Yep, and we need to get back to the, uh, the chief and said said WG refused. We don't, you know, that's too much of a compromise because of incident because of 2004 when you have officers and residents, mostly BIPOC folks, they did not feel comfortable in the meeting. Not not much was uh, accomplished. It's not going to work. Yeah, and and I didn't even have that. I didn't know that in that that group there was police officers represented. So, yes. I mean, Miss Pat has a conclusive example. You know, I mean, I was just going off of theory and 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 obviously the research I had. You know, we had done, um, but we have a conclusive example in terms of how it was not successful. So, well, nobody, nobody, including the police chief and the town manager, is recommending that police officers be on this committee. Yeah, but again, Russ, we're not doing this again. We're like not I doing said, for two it, of them. It, this is the two of them right now. But, yeah. you know, I mean, unfortunately, you know, we all know that anything can happen to us tomorrow, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so that chief who's there, who's again, being an ally, quote unquote, right? If he, you know, he's saying he's an ally, quote unquote, yes, great. You're not going to do it, but your successor might do it. You know, I mean, I can't go on any of that. So, As some generation, recommended not to have anyone with police background joining the oversight board. I remember that's one of their recommendations as well. So it's quarter to nine, we need to wrap this up. So I think we and I like your suggestion to go back to the, uh, your group to go back to uh, APD chief and the town manager and said that Pat on the back and Deborah refused. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I think we all we we all should be on the same page, though. I mean, if you all so Russ and and Brianna, are you all not you're not comfortable with that because you you were in those discussions, you know? Yeah. I guess what's I'm the thing? I, I just I'm not comfortable going back to the language we had before, 
whether there may be some other way to do it, I'd be willing to explore. Um, I, I'm comfortable with going back, but I'm a little bit nervous just because the chief did not anticipate such a powerful resident oversight board and miss pat deborah i really hear you like i hear you and i want these to be powerful recommendations but also i want them to be implementable and i want steps and actions so it's this really just delicate balance and i think that's why we are willing to compromise the language um but i'm willing to revisit it and find a way for him maybe for him to meet us halfway I, I, I think that if we brought up the 2004 instance, we might be able to move him and talk about group members and trust and bring it to that. Well, but I guess that I, I want to ask, different... I want to ask this other question, which is what did he think we were going to propose? You know what I'm saying? Like some weak um, oversight board, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, we were charged to come forward with recommendations that we felt would actually, you know, be something that would add to equity inclusivity and be able to have people, you know, have trust again in terms of, of some of these things. And to, in order to do that, for people to bring forward complaints and, and all those things and make some changes in the police, right? If we're gonna have a certain portion of the police be there, it has to be police that are going to, you know, be able to, to be held accountable and all of those things. So I guess, what did he expect? You know, some, some weak type of situation? That well, you have to remember though, Deborah too, and I'm not making a justification by anything, but do you remember he said, we didn't even know that people had an issue with trusting us so uh, everything is probably a f like a an enlightenment to him do you know what i mean but no, i get it i get it which is the problem saying? right which is right? the problem right but it's so my show. I, I want to make sure that we get to the DEI director position, but also my only concern with the constant going back and forth, particularly after the CSWG is dismantled, is that or not dismantled but dissolved, is that. I don't want you guys to give recommendations and then be like, then be like, no, and then nothing, right? Like, so I don't know where that balance is, but we definitely do need to find it or where the compromise is. We do need to find it because I would be very concerned with us or with you guys putting in these recommendations and then them just being like, well, you didn't change this and, and then not taking it, right? Like I just, and then there's no negotiation because there's nobody to negotiate with. Yeah, but the only thing is, sorry, I'm just gonna say a really quick thing, and then I know Alicia has her hand up, and and, and Russ, you do too, and everything. It's just the the, the only thing is, though, you know, I'm with Miss Pat in terms of we need to have our head head held high, though. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, for me, you know, to sign off on something where it says that you know we're going on trust with 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 with, with the current chief and and the town manager, where yes, you know, police will not be on the board. I mean, that's, that's huge. <laughs> that's a huge kind of, you know, thing for me because people are going to question me later on. Like, Deborah, what? You, you, you agreed to what? <laughs> you know, I mean, where, what planet are you from? <laughs> so, um, so I get that, but I, I'm just like, you know, maybe we need to have more discussion on this, you know, I, and I know that time is running out, but it's, you know, so... I've said what I had to say. I know there's other people wanting to speak. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Uh, Alicia? Um, yes, thank you. Sorry, you all, that I haven't been here this entire time, but I popped back in and I did want to say something, but first I wanted to ask if somebody might be able to remind me of what the language was that we had before this. I, I think that the language just said that no no one with who is working in law enforcement or has prior law enforcement could be on the board. Am I right? Yeah, yeah something like that. I don't have like that. that. Yeah. Okay. And so I think, issue. yeah. And I think, so that was one of the concerns that the chief did have. And I think that when he was explaining his concern with that, with that, it was that he, he was more ex expressing that there may be a possibility that a retired officer might want to participate and might actually have an interest or might want to actually work towards equity and dismantling racist police policies and all of these things. And so that we would be preventing them from participating. And so that was when we were talking about, okay, well, if there was somebody who had that identity, and for me, I was thinking specifically in my head about 
Tom who presented to us earlier, somebody like that who does that kind of work and wanted to be a part of that, then would we not let them be a part of it? And that's what his question was to us. And so we were thinking of how can we compromise on this area? But I think that we can, I don't know if everyone would be comfortable with this, but I think that there can be other avenues or other suggestions that we can make for them to be able to sort of help or offer ideas or be in conversation with the resident oversight board without giving them membership to the resident oversight board. And that that might be something to think about if we're gonna, if it is an issue that the chief wants to negotiate in some other way around this topic, that that might be a way to think about it. Like have an opportunity that if there is an ex officer who wants to chime in, that there's an avenue for them to have some type of connection with the resident oversight board and not necessarily for them to be a member on it. Don't they just go to the meeting and speak on it during public comment? Uh, thank you, Alicia. Ms. Pat? So I just have a response to that. Um, Alicia, thank you for sharing that. Actually, we have Human Rights Commission, and we've had people with, you know, law enforcement background, and, you know, legal background and stuff like that. I think if a retired police is interested in equity work, that would be an excellent uh, group to join. But when it comes to this, uh, oversight board, if you really want to recruit bold, courageous, BIPOC, marginalized folks, and you're throwing uh, somebody with law enforcement background with, with it, you're not going to get, unless if you want, you know, yes people. So Human Rights Commission will be a good place. It, uh, it deals with, hopefully, um, you know, issue, issue of justice, social justice. So they can they can volunteer over there, is what I say. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Ms. Rera. Yeah, and I think like, you know, I think Jennifer was bringing up a good point, which was more so kind of like, you know, and I don't know, because I haven't looked at the oversight portion of it in, in a couple, you know, probably a couple of weeks or whatever, right? Um, because I was very content with what we had put together and what Russ had put together and all of that. So my thing would be, I mean, maybe a negotiation stick, if this is important to you all, right, to, to be negotiating with the police so that this can pass, is to say, well, we get, you know, they can, the police can have, you know, like they're saying with a once a year negotiation or whatever, maybe we could put some feedback times where they can go and give feedback to Rob or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Um, to the to the, to the the Rob folks, right, that are on the committee. So the police give feedback and, and, and have their say or whatever, you know, and they listen and then, you know, they can go from there, whether they want to input it or not or whatever, whatever, you know, make changes. But maybe we could do something like that as opposed to, to, to saying, um, you know, that the police can, can, can be part of it, you know, whether they're retired or not, it's, it's not going to work, you know what I'm saying, for BIPOC people to be able to feel free to, to share and to really move forward courageously because it's going to be already difficult for them to even be on this thing because there could be repercussions for them to be intimidated anyway, right, by members outside of the group, you know, like police or others. So um, never mind them having to be intimidated within the group if, if there's members there, whether they're retired or police officers that are active, you know, I don't think it's a good idea. So maybe we can find other ways for them to give feedback. I'd rather go that way than, than, than having them serve on Rob. Okay, so I'm looking at the time just to move us forward. Do you, so are we in agreement that you all want us to go back and to, to renegotiate this or try to do, or do we want to table it and have more discussion on it? To we come don't back? have enough time to table it if it's okay for you guys to go back and renegotiate. I would just try to think of a creative way to include their input somehow exactly. to swap yeah. out what was yeah. done. And yeah. Russ, you're shaking your head. I wasn't there. So I don't, I don't mean, I don't know what the, how the conversation went. They, they weren't asking for input. They weren't asking to have police officers on it. They just found it insulting and uh, offensive to be, to have excluded? it excluded that they were excluded. 
you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not defending what they say, oh. but, yeah. but it's not like, I mean, I thought that might have been not the like our inviting them in to share something would take is, is what they wanted. That's, 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 that wasn't it at all. I, I don't know how this is all going to happen before next Tuesday or Wednesday, whenever it is we're submitting our report. I mean, I, yeah, to, to be honest, it's been really hard to coordinate a meeting for all of us to meet, but I think that we can reach out over email and tell him about this meeting and group members' feelings on it and find a club, not a clever, but a, find a, ni a nice way to say it. it. It Isn't that ironic that the chief feels that way when historically BIPOC folks, you know, we've been excluded for generations really it's laughable i'm i'm laughing but it's sarcastic yeah. laughter yeah and, and and i think that this is an educational moment though i think yeah. when you're talking about a clever way it's a way to also educate because again i don't know who brought it up i don't know if it was you jennifer or whomever that said he didn't even think there was a mistrust issue, right? So I think that this is another educational moment <laughs> mm. to educate in terms of why we think it's very important, you know, for him to take offense at the fact that, that you know, he's not really getting it. He's not understanding the history mm. of oppression, yeah. racism, whiteness, privilege, uh, right. you know, everything. That yeah. has that BIPOC people have lived yeah. <laughs> under yeah. with the police. He doesn't understand the history of violence. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, come on. I just, I, yeah, it's, it's okay. It's, it's, it's just we're beating, we're, we're feeling the same thing over and over again. And then, wow, yeah. it's difficult mm -hmm. and frustrating. Uh, yeah, I don't really know. Again, it's not in any other board or committee or even it's not wasn't part of yours because it doesn't typically happen, but that's not to say that it wouldn't. So it all just seems a little, you know, I understand where you guys are coming from. So that's not what I'm just trying to say. I'm just saying it all just seems kind of, I don't even understand why it's such a big deal on, on his end necessarily, right? Like they don't participate in boards and committees to begin with. So <laughs> why would it make a difference? Um, can we move on to the DEI director since they're going to have to go move that and it's almost nine o'clock. So Brianna, you're going to write a letter to the chief? Yes, I can Email? work on that. Yeah. Okay. If you need us to, to look at it or whatever before then just send it to Jennifer's, you know, at some point <laughs> on the weekend. Um, and then we can, uh, we can get you some feedback. If need be, if not, just Go for it. <laughs> Are you okay with that, Mr. Ross? I can't uh, tell if he's frozen. Oh, no. No. You know, I'm looking at the composition. This board only has one white person on it. I don't, I don't see any chance that that's ever going to be a police officer. But I mean, I, I, I'm fine with Brianna writing to the chief. But Russ, it's not even about race, though. I'm I'm sorry. It's it's oh no it's, no no. It's, I it's, know. The, it's the it's the it's the fact of using the blue uniform. Yeah, we might get a Tom, but a Tom is few and far between. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not gonna go by chance. All right? No, 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 no. And even a even Tom, I, right? That I've heard the argument. Up. I'm I'm okay with Brianna writing to the chief. Okay. <laughs> Um, so the next agenda item is the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee follow-up. But before mm -hmm. that, um, I think, Ms. Moisten, I think that before that was the DEI director at some point. Um, it was in this evening's packet. And if you all could send revisions to Ms. Moisten. And not my 8 yes. million things on my desktop. Yeah. I mean, we're interested in getting this to move too. And I think um, particularly Deborah, your feedback as well, since you've done the, the job. All right, so so this one, can you send a Word document to us? Just so. Oh, yeah, I can. If Just I have please any Please track your changes. You, and by when do you want these uh, this feedback by? I mean, this, this one, 
very similar to like the Crest one I wanted to advertise like two weeks ago <laughs> and or three weeks ago, and then it got pushed to the end of the month. So I'm going to say as soon as possible, right? Because we want to go ahead and be able to advertise for these. But please notice that it's rated at a level seven. Oh, okay, and, um, you know, I think this one could possibly be like, I don't, it is a lot of work, but with a good supported staff, I feel like this position would have a better chance of being the eight if they were the DEI director and the health and community service director, because all of those programs that fall underneath the health and community safe service programs are in dire need of doing their things through the lens of DEI, and they're all very face fronting to the community, but that's just my little pitch to it to get it to the eight, so. They're not going to get quality. Yeah, I will tell people I'm talking to 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 start looking at other places. Forget it. I don't I don't want to insult anyone. Level seven? Are you kidding me? That's what some college uh, grads are making now. It's employee market. Yeah, I will tell people to look other places. Yeah, I, or at least well, let's let's see if we can try to level it up. You know. Um, like what 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 Jennifer was saying by kind of adding, you know, but I guess I guess for that though, Jennifer, I mean, I don't understand all the different positions or who this DI, you know, director could oversee, right? Because I'm not part of town, you know, I don't know what the organizational structures are. But, yeah. but what like what Ms. Pat is saying, I mean, it has to be leveled up to like an eight or a nine in order for us to get the qualified candidates, especially if we want qualified candidates of color. It and a diverse pool, you know, what qualified candidates of color with the experience and with the the with this one, it's going to have to be someone that's also going to have the, the confidence, right, to take yeah. on structural well, races, well, well, this, structural I, institutions. I will I will say that this person, whoever takes this, he or she or they, um, this will be challenged because you know I'm a firm believer, and I've seen it here too that you know, people don't necessarily take well direction well from a person of color. And then they also um, want to challenge and see if they can pull rank. And so I think that um, this position is one of those positions that will always be kind of, it, we have to try and find it another solid base because I feel like um, someone will get either just feel not feel supported or burnt out from this position and it, just the way that it's written right now, regardless of what it's paid, right? Because I'm gonna say the microaggressions are real here at times and the, the challenges that you go through are real here at times. And so, and again, people feel some kind of way, particularly black or BIPOC women have a harder time taking it from BIPOC women than they do BIPOC men at times. Um, it's also very, challenging so the only thing i'm just trying to give it substance so, and then they just need to have good staff underneath them to help support with the other things right and then the folks from the health and community service the folks from the health department and the senior center and the veterans affairs and amherst recreation program would report to this one director mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense to me and all of those programs right there are in dire need of everything that they do is being done through the lens of DEI, if that makes sense, right? So the senior center, we already know, we read that health report. We already know that there, there's a, a desperate need there. And so I'm going to say, I think when it, when they put it through, it came in as a high six, low seven. So as is, I don't know that you're going to get it to an eight, I can't say yay or nay. I mean, it's really up to Paul at the end of the day, but my thought is to give them something else of substance and to give them the support underneath for staff wise that they need to make it successful. Because just this DEI director, the first few years is gonna be very challenging. Yeah. So, and, and then that note, I totally agree. I'm gonna have to sign off. So folks, sorry, it's like 907, I gotta go. Mm -hmm. My kids, oh, wait, I have to even put my kids to, to bed, so. 
<laughs> Wait, before you sign before you sign off, just really quickly, can we all agree to meet next week's next week, um, the 21st from 5 30 to 7 p.m. to discuss communications? I think that we should put out an article after our presentation to town council. Alicia and I have been working on something. We will send it to the group and have more dialogue on it during this meeting so we can add to it. I'm good. You're talking the 21st? The 21st, yes. Yeah, and we might have to also talk about just prep for it, right? I know you, you know, prep for the presentation and stuff like that, make sure. Can we make it six to 7.30? That works for me. Does that work for everyone else? Yeah. Six to 7.30, mm -hmm. the 21st, okay. Is that enough time? Well, you know it's going to end up ending at 8.30. 8 o'clock, so yeah. Let's do 6 30. to 8. That way people... Okay, 6 so to So we're 8. saying 6 to 8? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, folks. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> so we still have uh, Alicia, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I'm but still you guys, We still have, do you have four. Okay. Oh, yeah, you still have a quorum. So, I mean, I don't know about that option about moving it to the eight and having it I mean that is a lot to ask for a new position right to have four other departments reporting to them but I was just really trying to find something of substance to anchor the position down and include the higher pay people I've been talking to will not accept anything less than 90k it's like their minimum I mean well again because the DEI director it's all over it's all you just need to you know, look online, you know, a, a lot of communities, a lot of companies, companies are hiring DEI directors and they're paying six figure salary. Actually, that's what they're paying. So those, you know, I mean, hot, those are hot, the top, top earners or right? over a hundred thousand. Yeah. Say, so listen, I don't want to leave us without a quorum, but I really need to go in a couple of minutes. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, so, there, there's only one agenda item left and I can be very yeah. brief. And I don't know uh, what you guys want to do about that. So just revisions. Okay. Um, so the last, the last agenda item is the community safety and social justice committee follow-up. Um, can we move, can we table that to next week? I'm okay with that. Russ and Alicia, are you okay with that? And mm -hmm. Ms. Boyston? Yes, I'm in agreement. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, okay. I so um does anybody have any upcoming events that they want to share nope nope okay so um the next meeting date will be october 21st from 6 to 8 p.m are yep. there other topics anticipated not anticipated within 24 hours okay so with all of our business complete i'm calling this meeting adjourned yay all next okay. week thank you all everyone thank you thank you bye, bye. everyone bye, bye.